genah nemut be b tolokan be j pakata pus tolokan be le mah kemudian tolokan be le nemut betu tolokan mini kemok ni kemok tau tapus nah kemudian makam hulung ning gon lembut ni bay teme buat ba amfan amfan nemut mok duni teme Nahimok ni lulu sang unang ah, kung nai halimbaw nai balon sa lake, dina dina kopya na sa wat. I'm sure he did not ask me to go to the river with him or to go to the lake. So according to our heritage consultants, if we want to know the arts and culture of pre-colonial Visayas or ancient Visayas, we just have to look at the way of life and the arts and culture of the indigenous communities in Pindanao right now. So Lake Cebu is the home of the ethnic group Tibuli. We were so amazed that they made serious efforts to preserve their indigenous crafts, their traditional loom weaving of tinala, brass casting of jewelries and ornaments, and crafting of native instruments such as kumbing and higalong. We wanted to see how a kubing was made. So we were led to the outskirts of Lake Cebu and we found the kumbing maker in a house where the mother was also sewing a dress with native design. So uh, the Tibudis kumbing is kubing in Maranao. So in 1521, chronicler Pigafetta, who was with Ferdinand Manjalan, uh, he referred to it as kubing. Religious missionary Father Francisco Alcina described the subing as the musical instrument par excellence, as lovers would communicate secretly through playing the instrument. During panahon nga giban siya sa Osaka ethnic community, tuod kay he interfered siya sa mga arranged marriages na gihimo sa mga elders. Sangung alo mare bel menetu dumum se de fil nga lagi kem ga amilin. To Alcina, he said that the Visayans or the Visaya are a joyful people. Comes from the word saya. They use musical instruments. They they always sing, and when they express also their love, their affection for someone, they also use music. The player, Elma, composed her song, drawing from her experience of falling in love when she was still 15 years old. The song was filled with longing, for the object of her affection, whom she describes as very good looking in all angles, and he has a pointed nose. And most of all, he is hardworking, a trait that is very important for the indigenous people. She wanted very much to be with Filinon. 
lang. Wala din sa mga mo. Kaya ang asawa, ang lalaki na asawa sa Filimon siya na iabana. Oh. Kanta na lang. Asta. So what have I learned from these heritage trips? I saw that indigenous peoples that are struggling in trying to continue the crops. So they are wondering if the younger generation will be following their footsteps. So with the little things that we have done and the little things that we can do, we are looking at the whole community, especially the younger generation, to continue working together and supporting one another in promoting our heritage, in learning about our history and to be proud of our roots. Palmgrass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel, in partnership with the University of San Carlos Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History, the Trust de Abril Foundation Incorporated, the Diane de Heritage Center, and with the Central Visayas Association of Museums, of which the Galleria Independencia of Palmgrass Hotel is a member. We present to you this afternoon this very exciting event, another exciting event, Philippine Indigenous Textiles then and now, and we're so delighted, we're so glad to have conversations today with former Senator Nikki Koseteng. So of course, this uh, event will also take a closer look at this very important book, Sina uh, Unang Havi. I know one of our uh, reactors today just told me that this was in their library at, at the uh, Sacred Heart School when he when he was in high school. So he already read about this and this would have inspired him to become a fashion designer now. So, and also in, in his research also about our Babaylane. So she, she ha, he had also referred to the contents of this very important um, book. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here and for being very early. And we are always on time. We try to be on time. It's our Cebu time. <laughs> And that when we say we start at 3 p.m., we start at 3 p.m., so we start at 3.04, 3.05 p.m. So this is a hybrid event, so we have our online audience also with us. Uh, we have our, um, we, now, we now have online so many uh, of our online audience. We have uh, also from the Dep Ed, the Gig City, and Pateras uh, online and on-site. Thank you very much for being here. The supervisor of the Dep Ed, the Gig City, and Pateras, Arling Panlipunan, especially came here for this event. Dagang salamat to Ferdinand Pagao for being here with us and also to converse with uh, Senator Nikki Koseteng. We also have the teachers from the Dep Ed, the Gig City, and Pateras online right now. We have... Um, 
Liberata Policarpio. Uh, we also have actually uh, also uh, Raul Buzon, a, uh, a history graduate of the University of San Carlos, uh, who will be coming here also. He, he is online right now. We have Josh. And so please tell us from where you are, Josh. And and also Ash, Ash, Ashley, Ash, 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 Ashley, Victor. Uh, so dagang salamat for joining us. We we are so happy that so many are already online right now. Usually it takes a few minutes before many would become online. So this is really an exciting topic, a very relevant and exciting topic, and very relevant to our uh, to our generation today. So this month, April, it is a month of celebrations. We always mention what we celebrate during this month. So this month, April, is also this, as the celebration of the National Literature Month. So, of course, uh, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts um, uh, organized this to recognize the works of esteemed writers and scholars of Philippine and local literature. So here at Pamgras, we have our Basahanan Nilumaya. We, we have a bookshop and a mini library on books on, uh, on Cebu, Visayan, and Philippine culture and history and literature. So we have um, stories, novels, or uh, uh, po poetry from local authors at our Basahanan. So we always, uh, this is part of the arts that uh, would remind us of the, our rich culture. So uh, this is also celebrated to, to promote the history and cultural legacy of Philippine and local literature among the Filipinos today and the younger generation. So of course, also earlier this month, we also celebrated uh, Eid al Fitr. So um, earlier this week, so we, we, it is a, a celebration uh, that holds deep meaning for the Muslims and we are one with all our brothers and sisters. Uh, in fostering a community, a sense of unity, unity, and spiritual renewal. So, of course, we also know, so if you must have seen already our video that traces the Sinulug roots to Sulu. Uh, in one of our celebrations of the Sinulug here at Palmgrass, National Artist for Literature, Rizil Mujeres, that was in, in 2018. He was here in, uh, in January, and he was commenting of the performance of our staff of the Sinulog dance, and then he was saying, Sinulog was a Muslim war dance. And I said, yes, we will have a version of that uh, next year. So, so, we went, so we went to Sulu. So that was actually 2019, actually. So it, that was January 2019 when Dr. Isil Mujeres was here. So we went to Sulu. And so that's why that, that Babaylan dance you saw is part of that video we made we had our version of the Sinulog, where there is also a Babaylan dance. And in that dance are the martial arts dances of Sulu, the Pangalay, the Kuntao, it's in that dance. So we have a video tracing the Sinulog roots to Sulu. So that's why we are, and of course I am wearing right now, uh, but I'm, is it, my, my, uh, uh, Pishabit, the fabric from Pishabit and Pishabit, and a uh, candit and this these are fabrics from Sulu and I'm so amazed because we can just buy this from the from the public market in Holo so I was assisted by the professor of the Islamic studies of uh, Diliman UP Diliman uh, Islamic uh, Institute of Islamic studies professor Darwin Absari he helped us navigate Sulu <laughs> we are thankful to the governor of Zulu for uh, all, uh, facilitating our trip and also the vehicle and the, the squads of PNP guarding us <laughs> when we had a video shoot. So we, are, we really thank our brothers and sisters in Zulu for helping us trace our roots. So, of course, this month, uh, this April, uh, this middle of April, we will also be celebrating the Earth Day. It is, um, Pamgras is, aside from being a heritage hotel, we are a green hotel. So our furniture are made from recycled wood, even the steps of the, of the, of the, of the stairs and even the, 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 the tables at Kapihani Lumaya. We have our inverter, our air conditioner are in, uh, 
inverter and conditioner, we have solar panels. So we try as much as possible to reduce, reuse, recycle, and to reduce our carbon footprint. So we encourage our guests to, to, to join us in our green campaign. So Earth Day 2024 has the theme planet versus plastics. And also it focuses on the urgent need to combat plastic pollution and protect our planet's ecosystem. And of course, we need to plant trees we, to combat the heat. So we always uh, hear the complaints about the heat right now. And it is said that one, one tree is equivalent to five or more air conditioners. So, so cutting trees is harmful for our health. <laughs> so, and also we would like you to know that earlier this month on April 3, it was the 100, we celebrated the 126th year of the Battle of Tres de Abril. It was the opening salvo of the 1898 Cebu Revolution against Spain. And also on that day, on April 3, is also the seventh grand opening anniversary of Palm Grass Cebu's only heritage hotel. So we we especially timed the grand opening. Okay, we had a soft opening in uh, in 2016. So we we had the grand opening on April 3. So on that one on the anniversary of the battle of Tres de Abril, because we are inspired by why, what our heroes did, we give tribute to our heroes in the floors and rooms at Palm Grass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel, even in our food and drinks. And also in all corners, even this hall is a tribute to the Battle of Thursday of Abril. It is Hawan and Thursday of Abril with the red walls and also the golden sun of the Katipunan uh, symbols and also the Philippine flag. So, the company, wala, gamay na lang ni. So, <laughs> magsugod na yung tao, introduce sa ato ko. So, we, we also, of course, we celebrated uh, on April 3, the Battle of Thursday of Abril where, um, the Cebuanos rose up in revolt against Spain, led by a uh, Visayan whose roots are from, according to his descendants, Leon Quilat's grandmother was from Carcar, who married the pure Spanish grandfather of Leon Quilat. And the, the father of Leon Quilat went to Bacong Negros Oriental. So that's according to the, to the version of the descendants of General Leon Quilat. So the, the Cebuanos, with their anting-anting, they... They, they defeated the, the Spanish forces in the Battle of Tres de Abril with just bolos, spears, and knives against a company. Of course, there were so many. The, the Cebuanos were so many against the Spaniards. So after that successful battle, the, the membership of the Cebu organization, the revolutionary organization in Cebu, rose up to 2,000. Daghan na kain ng pamember. So, and of course, tomorrow, uh, on April 7, the Span in 1521, there is another today in history. It has so many comments at the Palm Grass, the Cebu Heritage Hotel page. It has already 1,500 reactions and so many shares, and they are debating about the impact of the Spanish arrival in Cebu. They arrived here on April 7, and it was said there that when, when, when Magellan planted the cross at the highest uh, peak at Mazawa, he saw that he saw the islands, the three islands with the most gold. He asked, "Where is the island with the most supply?" And it's one is Cebu, the be the biggest port. That's why he asked to be led here by the chief of Mazawa and the chief of the chief of I mean the chief of Butuan. And then, so they were there in the island because it was a hunting ground or it's a sacred place. Humunhon was a sacred place. So they came here on April 7. When Magellan came here, he announced his arrival with shock and awe with artillery fire. But on the beach was already the 2,000 warriors of Cebu in a battle position, <laughs> unlike his welcome in, in Humunhon and Mazawa. So anyway, there were so many debates about that. Where was the first mass? So anyway, in HCP has an answer to that. So this tomorrow is the baptism, the baptism April 14. So that's seven days after the arrival of, of, of Magellan in Cebu. Uh, the, the baptism happened and you would see that in our gallery of history, at the, our wall of history, the 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 chiefs in Cebu, Humabun said he had he was the leader of a confederation of Dato or Gamuros. 
it's not barangay, it's Gamuro, the villages in Cebu. And he was saying that they would not want to be baptized. They already were good men, he said. Of course, Magellan said they could all be killed if they don't get baptized. So <laughs> it was more of a political act. They already had a really a strong religion at that time with the Babaylanes. So that would be tomorrow. And of course, on April 27, there are so many things that happened on April 27. So on April 27, the Battle of Mactan happened where the, the Cebuanos or the Mactananos defeated the Spanish forces. 15 warriors, Cebuan, uh, 15 Mactan Upunganons died on that battle. But of course, they defeated the Spaniards because they defeated the the general or the commander in chief, the conquistador, they, they killed uh, Magellan. So actually, on April 27, we will have a, an event here at Pangras with Siliman University's vice president, a historian, and the vice president of Siliman University uh, for Academic Affairs. And we will be discussing Pangayao, Pangayao, the, the sea warfare in ancient Visayas, because, of course, as said by our historians, the Visayas, the Visayans were the terror of the seas in Asia and Southeast Asia, even in the 1100s. Even the Chinese were so scared because the Visayans were shipbuilders and seafarers and warriors, slave raiders. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they are called pirates. <laughs> So they, they are called, but that's the economic situation at that time. So we would learn more about that as we celebrate the five, 503 years of the victory at Mactan. And of course, 44 years after April 27, April 27, 1565, Ligaspi came back and Tupas and the other Cebuanos resisted the arrival of the Grabe ang April 27 note is the Battle of Mactan and it's also the day that the Spaniards came back to Cebu after the Battle of Mactan. So, timing lang yun. Coincident, coincidence ra to. <laughs> they came here again. They returned to Cebu 44 years after the Battle of Mactan. So the Tupas and the Cebuanos burned the granary of Cebu, of Cebu to deprive the Spaniards of food supply. And it's described there in our song at Pamgras the Cebu Heritage Hotel YouTube channel. You would see Kuyugiko. It has now 1 million views. It, it has a line that says, Kuyugikong mugakos sa, sa kalayo ni Tupas, andam da uban ang sugbo para malingkawas kuyugnimo. Not, not a translation. It has a translation there at our song. It has now... One, you are so surprised. It has now one million views. It's a song about history, but also about love. That love, like the love of our heroes. Mga ulipon, they're slave of love. Slave ulipon sa gugmang atay. They die and they fight. They fight and die for love. So, we're glad to like good day. So we are also happy to again to to know to let you know that Pam Grace the Cebu Heritage Hotel in the February twenty two. Um, and the Charter Day celebration of Cebu City was awarded as the, it was, uh, uh, Pomgras has been awarded this year as an outstanding institution of Cebu City. So, <laughs> so it says here that it is, uh, this, as it is in an appreciation of its unwavering commitment to preserving and promoting Cebu's cultural legacy through engaging exhibitions, book launches, diverse events, and cultivating a profound appreciation and understanding of Cebu history among youth and local communities. In all our activities, we always involve the youth and uh, we in, engage them, we engage with them, we help them make our content in our songs, in our dance, in our even our our books. We have a children's book illustrated by the daughter of one of our <laughs> so our our children's books, Leon Kilatawa and Sigbin was uh, written by Cebuano children and also illustrated by um Cebuano youth. The, the daughter of Miss uh Subaan is the Christine and Subaan is the illustrator, and she also made stickers of our Cebu heroes. It's available at our Sinugatan gifts from Cebu. So, we would like to recognize our partners the Trust the April Foundation, the University of San Carlos Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History. Thank you very much to Dr. Joy Hera for sending her students here to, to learn about our indigenous fabrics and also. 
the Trish Debril Foundation, the Andy Heritage Center, and Central Visayas Association of Museums. So we have our we we thank our participants on who registered online who said they came from the University of San Carlos School of Architecture, Fine Arts and Design. Thank you very much for joining us. Naitagasafadri or graduate or still students. So and then we also have the schools division of the Gig City and Pateros. We have participants from the Philippine Fashion Institute of Design and Arts. We have a, a participant from the Davao Central College. We have from the uh, from the Asian Center, University of the Philippines, Diliman. Thank you very much for joining us. We also have a participant from the National Museum of the Philippines and also from someone from the Department of Foreign Affairs. And of course, from the USC Department of Sociology, anthropology and history so maybe we could recognize others so just registered so we also have um jerome uh, matugina and also uh, uh brian yukaran a descendant of katiponers and uh, an advocate of cebu heritage and uh, from the cebu normal university thank you very much for joining we also have jason Closas from uh, from also from Upper Bicuta National High School, Tagig City and Pateros. Razik Zia, Razik, from where are you? And also we have um, Christina Ababo saying uh, hello. <laughs> and so uh, please tell us from where you are. And also we have watching Ferdinand Ascaraga who made the replica of pre-colonial Patanao earrings. So these are his creation. So for the, uh, also a heritage advocate and a reenactor of, of of Cebu history. We thank Iris Fernandez, Alinio Fernandez, a descendant of Cebu Catiponeros, uh, also here and as also a theater artist. Thank you very much for joining. So we would like to introduce to you also right now our reactors. Um, Na una ang reactor kaysa speaker. <laughs> okay. So we would like to our one of our reactors is a, a an, an advocate of sustainable fashion. So we have uh, ready na. So we have we ready na tong camera. So mo wave lang sa mo ha later na mo story. <laughs> so we have our uh, uh, one of our reactors, Dexter Alazas. So uh, thank you very much to Dexter for joining us. And also we have a professor from the University of San Carlos School of Fine Arts. We have um, Professor Piwi Rodney Sinining. And thank you very much also to <laughs> Professor Piwi. He helped us actually design the costumes of our theater artists in the Bagong Teatro Honkera, a play about our hero Leon Kilat and the, and the 1898 Cebu Revolution. Dagang salamat. And we also have with us so the one I told you that was a student of Sacred Heart School, Ateneo de Cebu, and a teacher, a fashion designer, a teacher of the Fashion in Institute of the Philippines, Ray Umberto Villegas. So we we noticed that he has uh, the family name is like our hero Pantaleon Villegas. Mga ko ani isog ni sila. <laughs> mga kaliwat ni og mga warriors <laughs> and babaylanes. So thank you very much. So of course, we are so excited today for our conversations with uh, Senator Nikki Koseteng and a closer look at the book Sinaunang Habi, a a, a book uh, published he, uh, she published in the 1990s is Philippine Ancestral Weave authored by Marian Pastor Roses, a book, a masterpiece studied or researched for 15 years so but this is nearly out of print and it's now a very you know valuable piece of um, art and, and uh, you know a scholarly book but also a work of art so so as said we would be having our we invite you we invite you to the april 27 event uh sea warfare in ancient visayas with um with uh Dr. Jude Earl uh, Cleope, Vice President of Siliman University, to discuss about Pangayaw, uh, sea warfare in ancient Visayas, and celebrating the 503 years of the victory at Mactan. And uh, on this day, we would also be announcing the winners of our spoken poetry contest. Uh, the the spoken poetry contest was held on April 3 to celebrate the Trust the Abril heroes. And, their videos of their poetry is still at Pangras, the Cebu Heritage 
hotel page, please vote or by reacting to your favorite poem. And so um, on May 10 also is the Night of Heritage participated in by 22, 22 museums in, in Cebu. And one of, of the participating museums is Pamgras the Cebu Heritage Hotels Galleria Independencia. And of course, this is a home hotel museum. And the theme for this is the beloved Visaya is about the Visayans. So uh, please join us on that day. So there are, I think there are still free tickets, complimentary tickets available. I don't know if it is it ran out, but there are premium tickets worth 300 pesos. And you are you already get an access to, to all museums and also to Tartanilia ride and bus rides to bring you to the different sites in, in Cebu. On that night, on May 10, 10 from 6 p.m. to 12 midnight. So we would like to, to tell you about, so as we start with our discussion, we would like to know that this, you to know that this topic, the, the indigenous textiles is very important because from the indigenous textiles of today, we see a glimpse, a glimpse of our past. And we know that in our, in, in ancient Cebu, in ancient Visayas, based from the, from the research of historians and also from the chronicles of missionaries, the Spaniards and the Europeans who chronicled what they saw in our islands. They mentioned, they described already, like you saw that um, our version of the Ababailan dance. So when Magellan came here in 1521, Pigafetta recorded a Paganito ritual and he described, Pigafetta described how fabrics, textiles, were really part of rituals. During rituals, you always have textiles. Aside from the attire of the Babaylan or the, the leaders or the, the Babaylan or the spiritual leaders, the site would also be adorned with fabrics or textiles. So the, the, there was a pag anito ritual. It was the slaughtering of a pig that uh, Magellan and uh, the, the Spanish forces saw in 1521 in Cebu. And it, the site of the ritual was, was uh, the ritual site was described as as follows. It was adorned with green branches, palm leaf cloths, palm leaf cloths, and colorful blankets, and offerings, red blossoms. Of course, there is always food in rituals, rice and millet cakes wrapped in leaves, and also pieces of, they also have imported cloth at the time. They, this, they mentioned it as a kambay cloth or kambay or kambay cloth. They were, and they were set on large plates and there was a large hog raised and fattened for, for that ritual. It, it was, it was, it was uh, laid on a grass mat. So nanay banig, um, banig was also part of the ritual. So that's why we have banig here. And also there was music uh, provided by gongs, drums, uh, and also there were porcelain plates already at that time where they had already traded with China. And so the, the Babylon, the spiritual leader, was an old woman wearing a headdress topped with a pair of horns. And, but there was also a historian who said that the headdress could be formed like a horn or it could be a horn or it could be formed like a horn. And um, there was a second medium, another Babylon, a, an assistant of the head Babylon, both carrying bamboo trumpets and they were either played, they either played or spoke through the bamboo trumpet. So they only the at that time only the women and the gays, the men dressed as women can only be only those women and men dressed as women can be spiritual leaders. So my interpretation of that was that for them only the feminine can communicate with the gods. Yes, the men cannot cannot be spiritual leaders. That, that changed during the Spanish period. The, and the, the, the Visayans were so against the uh, they were so against the, the, the new religion with men, but of course the priests are now dressed also in skirts. <laughs> so according uh, that's according to Dr. Jude Earl Cupe. So there is there are many discussions uh, about that. So and then of course in that ritual they dance they dance in rituals there is always dancing. It's just like really a total performance. The ritual so they they dressed gaily. Actually, there were um, in, in books and in history in history accounts it is said that the the gays are actually treated like women. They could not identify which one was the woman or which one was the the asog because they they look the same. 
Yes. Yes. And, they, and of course, the gays were more powerful. Uh, one of our reactors here in his research, he also mentioned he really had good research because he know that the gays were, were, were considered as most powerful because they have they were believed to have both sexual organs, the hermaphrodites or what's on Sagani na today, how can I with the both on sa nga sa LGBTQIA? Um, no, not trans, it's uh, transsexual. Uh, no, 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 it's the, the one with the both, uh, both gen, both koan sexual organs. Look, you know, we need to, we had just a discussion of that last, last, last March. <laughs> so, huh? For the old, ancient, but there is a modern uh, term for that right now. Maybe our audience knows. Uh, intersex. The, the modern, the modern, the modern term for that is intersex. So, oh, na na, comment na dahil sila, intersex. Thank you very much, JC Soiko from Where Are You? And Brian, uh, who said it's intersex. Thank you for, for providing the correct term. So, of course, in the in the Babylon ritual, so they there was always also drink, uh, eating and drinking, and of course the fabrics are the one of the really elements of of of, of um, pre-colonial ritual. So there is also a description by the missionaries of the clothing. So Chirino was saying, uh, Father Chirino was saying they had um, they were wearing already cotton and silk garments in in. In pre-colonial times, they had very gold gold pieces, brooches. They had they wore rich necklaces, pendants, earrings, fingerings, anklets, all made of gold. And the women wore dresses made of striped cotton and hemp, but some were of plain taffeta and damask from China. So they had already fabric from China, but they also were already weaving at that time. So there were there are descriptions of this. So now. So of course I already showed you that uh, we have our replica of the gold patanaw, golden patanaw. This has uh, 24 karat gold plated uh, brass, brass cutlets, but gold plated. So this is available or sinugatan gifts from Cebu. So karon wa di na gid ma di na ato na yo introduce ato <laughs> at resource person so we are so delighted it is our honor and our pleasure to have with us today a very prominent figure in Philippine public service and cultural preservation. We have with us a a former senator of the Republic of the Philippines so is also an advocate of various causes, including education and women women's rights. And I'm also delighted to let you know that my father, my late father, was really a big fan of her. She, he thinks of her as so beautiful, so so uh, talented, and so really, uh, she, and he admired his her, her advocacy for a renewed Philippines. So we have, uh, we, we, her passion and advocacy have made her a very respected figure in political and cultural spheres in the Philippines. So we please help me welcome. We are so happy to have her with us on site, physically here at Congress the Cebu Heritage Hotel, Senator Nikki Coseteng. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Agribina, for the invitation. I think it's very kind of you to have um, invited me to this forum. And um, I hope that our audience will be really um, participatory and engaged because it's a very interesting topic. And um, I, was, I came in the hope of um, learning from you more than you learning from me. I... <laughs> I thought that this book that was published in 1992, that's what, over 30 years ago, you know, still, um, still uh, to this day has um, not been followed by any other book of this same category or is this same quality. And um, I give the, all the credit actually to Marianne Pastor Roses. Marianne is a museumologist. She's anthropologist, she's a historian, a curator, 
And um, I thought that she did an excellent job. She was doing this research for the De La Salle University. And after almost more than a decade, um, the materials that she was able to collect were actually left in the library or, or the archives of De La Salle University. And um, that was at the time when I met, that was the time when I met her and I asked her um, what she was doing and she explained all of this to me. So um, I thought it was such a waste because, you know, um, this kind of information, which is, I think, as most of you here, or if not quite a number of you here are anthropologists, would probably cover two, three, or maybe even four semesters of anthropology. So Marian had all this information, and um, when we were discussing it, I said, well, we should publish it. And she said, oh my God, it's gonna take a lot because who's gonna read all this material? Who's gonna read it? It's boring to get into this, you know, pages and pages and pages of, of prose and research. So um, I said, well, let's get a photographer and let's kind of like get started. It was really just like a dive into um, an, endless, an endless pit because we didn't know, I didn't know anything about book publishing. And um, I, we, so we got wig Tysmans to, to, to get this, to get the photographs of the people in their communities. So if you see the Subanan women, she's from, she's really from Zamboanga. If you see a Mandaya or if you see a Kalinga, if you see, you know, these, these women and men were really from their own communities. They're not models. They were not, you know, posing for anything, for, for a, um, um, an ad, ad, um, advertising material and um, it was really actually the behind the scenes of the book could really be a product of another book and so um, I thought that um, this was a worthwhile endeavor many people said we were crazy I said it doesn't matter it's okay we, we are known to be known as crazy <laughs> and Einstein was thought to be crazy so it didn't it wasn't really an insult it was really more like an overwhelming um, uh, undertaking. So Wig Tysmans did the, the photographs of all the pictures with people. And then we got Dick Baldovino. I hope you still remember Dick Baldovino. He was one of our ace photographers in that time. He has passed away since. And he happens to be the brother-in-law of Jose Hoya. Yes, the artist. So um, again, um, thank you. Thank Agri you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so I guess it was because I was the publisher of this book that um, made Agrippina invite me to come over. And I also happened to be a textile collector. Actually, I viewed the book as a kind of like a peek into my collection. Um, some of the other collectors had already since then, um, you know, transferred these collections to me. And um, it's still intact. And um, I was looking at um, being able to share this, not only for the scholars, not only for the college students of anthropology, etc., but hoping that one of you would come and break the book down so that we can start this information campaign at the preschool level. It's very difficult to get people interested when they're already in college because they would have 18 years of nothing. And all of a sudden, this whole 212 pages of information are going to get into their, <laughs> into their hands. And um, there's really no affinity. And there's probably even, sh there's even more shame than affinity to these things, you know? And so this is something that we'd like to try to break. How? That's all of us. All of us will have to think about it. Um, in many occasions, the people who, who are from those indigenous peoples, um, communities, may not even know about their real textiles anymore. A lot of them are wearing t-shirts and jeans. Yeah? And so, and some of them are, are now seeing maybe very creative, maybe elaborate um, other designs. And they also saw how difficult it was to make them in that very subtle, that very elegant manner that they actually were. Sometimes ang tingin natin sa sariling nating art is parang kulay jeepney, di ba? And so the indigenous peoples never had kulay jeepney in any, in any of these 
uh, materials, there was never such a thing as a kulay jeepney. Now, this indi indigenous, I mean, natural dyes and natural fibers did not exude this kind of um, maybe gaudiness, if you want to call it. And, um, you know, even if they had insects or animals, etc., in the fabrics, they were never really like three feet lizards, you know. I mean, imagine trying to wear something with a three foot lizard in it, or even a six inch lizard. That's pretty big, right? I mean, their lizards were like one inch. How, how on earth were they doing ikat out of these things? So um, it took a lot of pain. It was mentioned earlier that this was, these were products of rituals. Or weaving was a ritual. It wasn't a livelihood. Weaving was never a hanap buhay. So today, as we look at it as a hanap buhay, if it's a hanap buhay, then it's an 8 to 5 job. No, weaving was never an 8 to 5 job. Women wove when they had the time. Maybe they, they had to care for the sick. They had to feed the chickens. They had to do housework. They had to do so many other things. And by the way, they had to weave. So it was really the amazing genius in every woman that created all of these patterns that were hardly repeated. It wasn't like it wasn't like today when people would say, "Okay, we need three containers of something, and uh, we have to export this tomorrow," <laughs> you know, so we could earn a living. It was never that way. So I think that weaving has to be given the proper recognition, because even today, it has always um, textiles, Philippine textiles, are always looked upon as costumes. And that's sad, you know, because a Batman costume cannot be worn by a, by a you know, 300-pound person. And a Santa Claus costume cannot be worn with somebody with the body of Superman, right? Because they're costumes. There's, they have to fit somebody to look like something. But as a national dress or as national um, garment, um, they should be able to fit anyone. I mean, look good on anyone and everyone. You carry it with pride. And this is also the, what happened in Sinaunang Habi. Sinaunang Habi, Philippine ancestral weave. If you see the pictures, the, the, the men and women and even youngsters who wore these, costume, wore these garments didn't look like they were wearing costumes. They look like they are part of their soul, part of their, their hearts, you know, that, that they were using these um, garments. And the thing was, None of them, very, very few, practically, very, very, very few of them were actually using their own, their own textiles. These textiles were borrowed from collectors, brought to their habitat, brought to their communities, and they were, whoever would fit, you know, they were very s small in those days, right? So whoever would fit the garments that we brought were the ones that wore them. And so you can see them in sing, single, uh, well, in singles or doubles or three in a picture or maybe even a whole, um, a whole group or a whole family. But um, all of them, if not, yeah, I'd say almost all of them were really not wearing their own um, textiles. So you can just imagine how we could convince the collectors to lend their museum pieces to people they didn't know. You know, they could get torn, they could get stained, they could, etc. So that was a risk. And little did we know in those days that today they would be now in the hundreds of thousands of pesos per piece. Some even as far as the millions per piece. Per textile. Yeah? But it's not only here. If you do a little bit more research in the Chicago Field Museum, in the basement of the Chicago Field Museum, you will still find crates and crates and crates and crates of Philippine indigenous textiles. They've not even been opened yet since the time they were taken from us. To this day, they're still in crates. So, I mean, this is something that, you know, we, we, we have to understand and we have to appreciate these things. Of course, if you go to Indonesia, that's another ball game altogether. Because the minute you land, you know you're in Indonesia. The minute you land in Jakarta or in Bali or wherever, you, wherever your port of entry is, you right away know you're in Indonesia. Because you can actually be seeing people wear 
$5 batik or $5,000 batik. And right away, there is that affinity, even among themselves. So it becomes, it becomes a source of income. And this is why Indonesia has really, really capitalized on its textile industry. Here, it's very difficult to even promote this because we don't even have the source of raw material. The cotton, where are you going to get the fibers? The abaca, even abaca. Abaca is a fiber that is available only like from Taiwan all the way to Mindanao. That's it. You really cannot find it where else. Sambales, wala. You know, you cannot go anywhere else and find it. It's just this very narrow strip. And yet, in the traditional way, in the indigenous people's way, the abaca skirts are almost like linen. So you can imagine the effort that went into pounding and breaking the materials that are used to pull up the anchor of a ship that strong and then to make it into a skirt. To dye the skirt in the ikat in the ikat fashion, in the ikat manner, you know, and and um, <laughs> it's just really, really awesome. It's really amazing. It's 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 almost you you can't really do it unless you probably are in a trance. You cannot, you cannot. So there's all these other um, maybe we we would maybe call it even supernatural, or maybe you just have to not be in your real self to be able to do it. Because in your own consciousness, just by that, I don't think it can be done. Now, if you're going to look at the textile from Kalinga, from Bontok, from the north of the, the Cordillera regions, and all the way down to the south, you can see that, well, of course, in those days, they didn't have text messaging. They didn't have um, fax machines so that they can tell each other, hey, I'm doing this. Can you do that also there? So we kind of like look united, you know? No, nothing like that. So the consciousness was one, right? And everything was really on a two-dimensional plane. There are really no circles. Even the circles of the Kusikos in Abra, for example, or the Ilocos weaves, you can see that these circles are actually rectangles and squares of different sizes that eventually look like they form a circle. But that is entirely purely mathematical. So these women of those days are not uncivilized. They are not dumb or stupid. No. Why? Because they could count. You cannot come up with these kinds of textiles if you are not a mathematical genius in some way. You have to count. To be able to even make a banana leaf pattern or, uh, uh, or, or bayabas, a guava rather, a guava, guava leaf pattern or rivers like in, in Ilocos they call Karayan like that, you know. So because uh, Karayan is a river in Ilocano. And then you can also see how the language, the language of weaving has actually, was actually a unifying element. You know, if you, indigo as a basic product, for example, Indigo, it, it can be called tayum, it can be called tayum tayuman, it's called tagum, you know. So all these things put together form an actual consciousness. And that consciousness is something we don't know, we don't have, we're not interested in, we don't respect, and sometimes even look down on. So this is the sad part of it. So I think, um, you know, we, we can really go on and on into this because it's very, very, um, it's really a very deep culture. And all of us here in Southeast Asia carry this kind of consciousness before the colonials actually massacred people and actually became in and, you know, in, imposed their impositions, which can be a, another subject matter altogether. <laughs> yes. But then that you can see that, you know, we were really one people and one culture. So if you see the weaves of Indonesia, Cambodia, um, even uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, you know, like that. You can see that this is really one people. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank Olympia. you very much, Senator Nick Nikki. So we would like to know uh, about your, how did your interest in Philippine textile start? Actually, it's, I don't know how to explain it. Primarily, it was because at the time when I got into textiles, I really could not afford celadon jars. Now, everybody was buying celadon jars, sung jars, sawang kalok. People were buying blue and white, ming jars, you know, 
And so, wow, you need a lot of money to buy that. And people were looking down on textiles. Tela lang yan. Yung tela mukhang basahan ng gusot-gusot na, you know, somewhere hidden, somewhere inside a jar or somewhere else, you know. So I said, oh, um, the jar is so much, I'll just buy the textile. I went to school in Baguio and it helped. I was in St. Teresa's um, Girls High. I went to Brent School in Baguio and I went to um, St. Louis Girls High. So I had a lot of time in the market. And in those days, in the market, we had um, still people, up to now, Mary Ngalawen still has her, her shop um, in, in the Mar Bay market, you know. But um, in those days, there were very few of us who were, who were actually interested in the textiles. So that was how it started. But then I found out, wala eh, parang, it's only textiles. You can never have enough because there's no two of a kind. No two of a kind. And they were cheap. Because everybody was running after the cobalt blue. You know what I mean? It was all like that. Everybody's looking for all these um, uh, um, porcelain pieces. So that was how I developed that interest. But really, I couldn't afford to buy the jars. That was one. <laughs> Second, I found them to be very colorful and there was really an, it, it was really like an addiction because you can never have enough of it. So that was how it became 17 maletas, you know, like that. From just buying one at a time, one at a time. And the deeper you go into it, the more you learn about it, then the more you really, it, the hunt is really more than, more than just buying it, it's really the hunt, of, the hunting for it, you know. And so in those days, there was still an Aldevinco in Davao, if you remember that. There was a, like a one-story, kind of like a strip mall, and they had many people would go there. And then um, there were a lot of dealers that would eventually bring the better ones to you because they know that you're buying, right? But now I cannot afford it anymore. It, the, the textiles are more expensive than the jars. Today. Baliktad na eh, baliktad na. With the jars, they lasted... They, they last, you see, they, they stay. The textiles uh, get burned, get torn, so it, it becomes more rare. So to, to find the real ones, the real things, is 10 times, 10, 20 times more expensive than a jar today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. Actually, there are already interactions from our audience. So earlier when you talked about weaving, uh, Philip Rodriguez, uh, also a fashion designer, uh, a renowned designer here in Cebu, it was saying... Oh, yes, I met him in his store. Yes, and he is watching Ness. right now Ness. and also Ness. agreeing agreeing with you. Oh, hi, Philip. <laughs> so, so we also have... Uh, thank you very much, Ginoong Pilipinas uh, 2023 or 2022. Uh, Lars Dawson for being here, 2023. And also, he is also a runner-up of the, of the Miss... Mr. Universe Tourism, congratulations. In Bali, congratulations for, for the win. It's still a win even then. <laughs> yes, the congratulations. So we have an, uh, also um, uh, from USC uh, polit uh, Dash, political anthropology class, uh, Irish. And also uh, we have a tour guide from Cebu, Dodds Milan, saying it's a lively discussion on heritage. Habi maayong hapon, Miss A and the team of Tamgrass and Senator Nikki. And we also have um, also Hostina from USC and um, Feb Balanta Coleta from uh, is saying about the Bicol uh, region having a term for the intersex. And also we have um, Fe is asking, oh, anong klaseng tela po ginagamit para pang balot ng patay? We don't know if uh, Senator Nigi can answer this. Uh, of course, we have discussed about rituals uh, in our ancient period. We have a burial practices discussion last October. Look for it. And uh, does uh, Senator Nikki, can, uh, may you answer this question? Yeah. Actually, in the Cordilleras, they have specific um, textiles for um, burying the dead. You know, so, but you can see, there they're like white and sometimes they have a blue, looking like a blue stripe. But I will show you in the book that that blue stripe is not a blue stripe. And that white is not white like our bedsheet. No. Even those plain white 
cloths still have that motif, that pattern, a diamond and a dot in the middle. A diamond and a dot. That's consistent throughout the textile. And then you have the stripe. So that stripe is still teeny weeny ones, but that's very consistent. Remember, the diamond and the dot. The diamond and the dot. So even in Agrippina's, um, you can see the textile, the fabric, yeah. you will still see that diamond and a dot. It's just that it's half a diamond here. It's a triangle, right? So if you, if you, if you um, extend the, the triangle, it will become a diamond, right? And that dot in the middle, that orange dot, is still a dot. In, but in those days, that entire pattern is less than half an inch. So you can imagine how it, what it takes to make it f a four inch square and a one centimeter square. And that you can find in the book. I'll try to get it now. Yeah, so, so now we, we, would, we would like to ask uh, Senator Nikki, why, what motivated you in publishing that book? That very beautiful and pressure, precious book. Well, <laughs> Sinaunang Habi or Philippine Ancestral Weed. If I started um, looking at, or if, if, if um, the calling for textiles, say, happened in 1968, 67 maybe, 67, 68, around that time. This book was published in 1992, which means we had already worked on it since 19, the, 90, the early, early 1990s or late 89s to be able to publish it in 1992, right? So um, from 68 to, let's say, 88, that's already 20 years. And in those 20 years, there was hardly anything that was written that was readable. Many things were written, but they were archival materials. So I said, how about people, if there's one person like me, there must be others, hundreds, thousands of other people who are looking for this material. So I, <coughs> excuse me, I, I took it upon myself to just say, bahala na si Batman, excuse me, and say, let me go ahead and do it. And I hope that others would appreciate that, you know. So that was how it started. There was no material available. Unlike in Indonesia, if you go to Indonesia today or Thailand and you look under textiles, you will have floor to ceiling, wall to wall of rooms and rooms and rooms of publications on their textiles. Whether from Sumba, <laughs> whether from Yogyakarta, where, wherever you go, it doesn't matter. You will have Volumes and volumes written, pictures and pictures, unbelievable. They even have a batik museum, you know, and it's it, and and it's sad because now instead of working on the abaca and pounding it, come on, now there's machines, right? No, we sell the abaca raw, and that's really sad. Why? You sell them to the Japanese, you sell them to the Chinese, you sell them to every anyone else in the world. They make them into tea bags. So why do you want to make your why do you want your precious abaca to be made into tea bags and, and think that that's the best way to have economic development? So you, you, you turn your people into slaves because they will only plant it, harvest it, and, and roll it, and put it in the sako and send it out. So there is no creative value added. There is no artisanal um, you know, support network that, that can do this. You know, my, 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 grand, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my grandmother, they always just wore abaca slippers. And the abaca slippers of my mother's time, my mother passed in 2001. And the rubber slip, I mean, the abaca slippers that then she bought, you know, many pieces because it was going already. You still can wear them today. If you buy the abaca slippers today, some of them are eight, nine hundred pesos. Okay, yeah. But in two months, they're nothing. They're just disintegrated. I don't know why. What happened, right? So these are some of the things. So why did I, why did I go into that? It's because there was nothing to, to, and nothing for the younger people who are still interested in making it for them to be guided by. What designs are they going to make? You know, so... 
and I hope that people will, that's why we made it into a coffee table book because you can just read the captions and learn a lot from it already. But more importantly, you have to read the text. It is hard because the text is not like a fairy tale textbook. No, I mean a material rather. The text is still scholarly work. It's still based on research. It's in the language of the people who were doing these weaves in their own places, in their own communities, you know. So this introduces you to that, right? So let me just look for the, 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 the how they do the white, plain white. It's not plain white, you know. You can actually see the consistent pattern and that. Just as an aside, you know the, the tattoos, the, the, the women who had tattoos in, in the Cordillera? There was a challenge. Weaving is a two-dimensional um, medium, right? So you cannot make circles. Unlike painting, if you had the ball pen, you can make circles like this, right? So they were saying, oh, it's only like that because it's weaving. No, in the tattoo, was also like the, the pattern is in the tattoo that are the same as the patterns of the weaves. Which means, even if they had a chance to make circles, wala sa language nila yung circle. Lahat yan, nandun nga sa ganyan. And it, you can only see the circle as an optical illusion. And the circles as optical illusions are because the lengths of triangles and squares are graduated. In the same way you see a graph, in a mathematical graph, you have a vertical and a horizontal line, which is much, much like, a, a, a we, in, like, like in weaving, right? So if you say the coordinates, one and one, and then it becomes one and one half, one and one third, one and one fourth, then you have a curve line. So you see the curve line, but really, it's really still vertical and horizontal. I mean, I'm trying to just kind of like explain it in the maybe simpler form, right? Okay. Yes. So uh, Senator Nikki is still browsing the book. I think this book, the, the pages are, are actually sticking, but in this book, it's there are no... It's, I actually t looked at that book a while ago, and then there are pages that stuck, but then maybe it's already okay now. So while um, uh, Senator Nikki is browsing over the book, we would... We would like to read some uh, comments from the, our audience. So we have um, we have this um, uh, Christine from USC uh, Department of Anthropology and Sociology. Uh, also, um, we have also a question, but maybe later uh, Senator Nikki can answer this later uh, from JC of USC. Also, how will some of the Filipino designers give? recognition and credit for the Filipino textile in the world of fashion. I think this is, we have a question for this later. So may, may we show the, yes. Uh, so uh, can we have, can you see the fabric? It's just really white. Pwede ang camera. Just white like that. Okay. No. This is another, another Microphone. Fabric. Microphone. A, a, Hold the mic. Yeah, this one. So if you see it at close, yeah, if you see it at close range, um, close range, you it's hard to see it from there. But anyway, you will look at it later. What you see that looks like just stripes from afar are actually series of diamonds and dots. To, to put it in plain and simple language. Adjust you know? the camera. Diamonds and dots. So even this blue stripe over here, this blue stripe over here, you have a diamond and a dot, a diamond and a dot, a diamond and a dot. And that's all consistent throughout the textile. Even the teeny weeny space over here, it's still like that. Here it's the same thing. You see, these are all diamonds and dots. Diamonds and dots here, like that. You see? Even this plain white, you can see it? You still see that the pattern is still always there. So I just want to read the um, caption. It, it's not very long, no? because now that you've seen it. So it says there, this is from um, Abra, and it's an itneg piece, right? Cotton, um, itneg. Then it says, 
Very infrequently was there mention of the use of this type of OS. OS or less blanket, yan, no? In a ritual context. In the earliest ethnographic monograph on the Itneg, its use seems to have been limited to prestige displays during death. Death. Today, however, there is information regarding the use of these blankets in Dawak ceremonies. In general, nonetheless, the textiles such as those shown in plate 187 and 190 were those that figured prominently in extremely sacred rituals connected with birth and curing as opposed to limited social hierarchy uses. So, you know, there were always um, different weaves or different textiles were also used depending on the, on the prominence of the person using. We had, we had one of these, we had one of these subjects who refused to wear, who refused to wear the, the, the garment that we brought for him to wear. So we were trying to convince him to, to, to wear it because that was the, the textile of his actual people. So what happened? We ended up using one, two, three, four pages on him because he refused. Ayaw talaga. So this is, for example, this textile here is, we call it Dato Udang eh. Um, he was 69 years old in 1990, in the 1990s. So you can imagine it. If I don't even know if he's there. So this is a bagobo, a bagobo person. I mean, that's he, he was a bagobo. And we were asking him to wear this costume, and it took us two days to do it. You cannot imagine the hotel expense, the food expense of a whole they, they don't come from their communities by themselves, they come in busloads, you know. And you cannot tell them, sorry, I'm only going to feed one person because the rest are not kasala in the book. No, you can't do that. So anyway, so you can now see this garment. This, <laughs> he always thought that this was his tribe's, uh, people's garment. This had sequins. It, had, it was very colorful. It had rickrack. It had, you know, ribbonets or something like that. And he just believed that that was their outfit. Okay? So, okay. We will take a picture, but we'll make it very dark. But we'll make it dark. But we'll make, take, your, take your picture using that. But you see how dark we made it? That's not, that's not by accident because the photographer is dumb. No, that's Rick, Rick Tyson's picture. So, this is him. Datu Odang. Now, I will read to you now the caption to show you how real this book is. So now, it says, sorry, I have to remove my glasses when I read. It says, Datu Oscar, that's Oscar Udang actually. So Datu Oscar was initially unwilling to wear the old loco and uh, salwat tungkulu nor, in fact, the Tongkulu Pamudmud that was part of the set. He refused to acknowledge these garment pieces as bagobo. We will write it, put it here, you know. Um, the likelihood is that this very rare type of clothing, documented rather thoroughly in the early 20th century, may have been created only within a narrowly circumscribed sub-area of Bagobo culture. That of the Jangan. Remember that. That of the Jangan and not the Tagabawa. Not the Matig Salug or the Ubo. Much later, Datu Oscar let on that he was deeply uncomfortable with the association of these garment pieces with the Mangani culture or Mangani activity of earlier times. Okay, and in particular with those activities which he felt are best laid to rest, such as human sacrifice. 
So, documenting his reservations in this book is this author's way of recognizing the conjoint Christian and Bagobo ethic by which Datu Oscar has lived most of his life. The costume itself has not been worn by the Bagobo since the denouement of the way of the Magani prior to the Second World War. The use of Magani garment was a matter decided by convocations of elders, all of whom were Magani. So at that time, headhunting was still part of their culture. And so they, he felt that he's not one of those great ones. If it, it's, it's like in today's situation, it's like making a private wear a general's uniform. You say, oh, that's not me. I'm not a general. He had this kind of ethic. He had that kind of respect for his culture. Diba? Binabayaran mo na siya ng 2,000 pesos. Ay, hindi niya isusuot yan kasi hindi kami yan. Hindi ako yan. Mas mataas na tao yan sila. And they did not decide that I am worth it. You see? So the Filipino culture had this kind of respect for this kind of hierarchy. They were not equal. <laughs> hindi yung everyone was equal. Everybody, first name calling. Walang ganon. Okay? Now, in that dark picture that I showed you, kailangan kasama yung dalawang apo niya pakiusap. So, sinama namin yung dalawang apo niya. Dr. I mean, Datu Oscar Udang and his grandchildren were in these photographs the Bagobo ensemble that they are happiest to represent their culture with. All the materials in their clothing are new except for the for the uh, heirloom Klobau headcloth that signals both past and present identity for the Datu. So in this book, even cuentos like that, we have to put it there because that's factual. This is not to sell a book and, uy, para maraming manunood, maraming makikinig, para may tumawa, para maaliw kayo. No, no, no. This is nothing like that. So this book is actually documenting that. He had reservations because he felt he was not deserving of it. Yes. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, story of how that book was made. No, I mean, say that's just, that's just one, one of the stories. One, one. <laughs> yes. So we also know from our previous discussions with, for example, from Higaunun and Talaandi communities, and they always had this attire for the different um, uh, class, uh, I mean, the different people in the community. So there is a specific attire for the Dato. There is a, a attire for the for the warrior and of course for the women and they, they even have a headdress that is only worn by really the, the those uh, who are already allowed to wear that headdress. So, for example, like they would say that right now in for example in festivals they are forced to wear the headdress of supposedly a sacred headdress of a really a uh, a bailan or a someone who has who already earned the the the, the right or to the authority to wear that headdress so right now in, in some festivals they are already forced to wear some headdress that as, are not yet supposedly not to be worn yet by someone who has not yet earned the right to wear that headdress yeah. even worse now they pretend that that's their headdress sometimes yung walis tambo lagay lang ng mga Beads, ginawa ng headdress. Sabi ko, ano yan? Parang that's, that's an insult to, to their people, you know? Like that. But you see, this is something that we have to understand. That there is pride. There is recognition. There, there is a hierarchy which today has broken down. You know? It has broken down. And, and this now has repercussions. Where is Indonesia today? Where is Malaysia today? Where is even Vietnam? You know, 5 million tons of bombs were dropped in Vietnam. 5 million tons. You can check it in the internet because I don't want to be, you know, talking about it in out from just out of the blue, okay? 5 million tons. They lost 3 million Vietnamese. Why are they now ahead of us? There is something that's wrong somewhere. And unless we can root it back to the culture and back to the, I don't know, dislocation of our own culture of our own mental state of affairs 
You cannot keep blaming everybody. Okay, the Americans did this, the this, the, 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 the. And dami niyan eh, di ba? But in the final analysis, you have to look at yourself. What kind of people do you have? I mean, you can't go to a doctor and say, um, I'm sick, you gotta treat me. And so what's wrong with you? Oh, nothing. I'm good. I'm great. You know, I can run three miles a day and this and that. And you expect it to be. You have to accept first and foremost, there's something wrong with you. And when, then that's when it starts. Then you start building from there. Otherwise, it's very difficult, right? So I think weaving is, is already a, a benchmark for what we can do. Why do you accept to be treated in that way or this way? You know, there are many poor countries in the world and in many countries there are poor people. But how many of us, or them rather, would like to see an engineer work somewhere else as a draftsman? How many peoples in other places would like, would see their teachers work as laundry women? If you know what you are and you know what kind of pride you have to have in yourself, or at least your people, like this Magani culture of those days, then you will say, oh, I don't want to be like that. I will have to strive for this. I have to have, I have, to have a level of excellence that only I have. And my people will all say the same thing. So you have 110 million people thinking that way. Then the outcome will be different. The outcome will be different. Because if you look at yourself as a rag, then somebody will pick it up and wipe their shoes with it. But if you see yourself as a pearl, a pig can come along, not recognize this pearl, ignore the pearl, and just walk by. A pig would do that. So are you going to turn yourself into Kanin Baboy so the pig can recognize you? So these are things that you have to state as clearly as the noses on our faces. It's not nice to hear. It's nice to hear, oh, we're great people. We're, we're doing this. Thing. Yeah, we have many great engineers. We have many great architects. We have many great uh, accountants, doctors, you know, teachers, etc., etc., etc. Then why are we a failure as a nation? Marami award, di ba? Ang dami, the best this, best that, best this, best that, ni Filipino. Even among the designers. We have excellent designers, very creative people. But we don't have an industry, right? You know, you, 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 uh, you, you, you can't produce a Hanai Mori. <laughs> or even if you want to make it uh, comme de garçon, you can't even do that. And yet, if you look at uh, these works, Yoji Yamamoto, for example, whoa. Sometimes you see, oh, that's very comfortable. It's so nice. You know, it's wide, it's big, it's baggy, it's like that. I, I don't know. It, it, it should not take a Filipino such a difficult time to, to produce a Yoji Ma Yamamoto thing before he did. Right? So this is what I mean. There's, there must be something wrong and it's that missing link. And that missing link is the culture. That's where I think it's coming from. But you have to recognize it and acknowledge it. Because denying it, and all this denial, and parang, you know, hindi, hindi totoo yan, kasi magagaling tayo eh. Eh, bakit tayo nga nakukulelat? Diba? That's the, the ultimate analysis. Bakit tayo kulelat? Diba? That's it. So, thank you very much, Senator Nikki, for the your passion in in this, uh, in our culture. And so, we, we ha you ha I guess you have all discussed about the language of weaving, and the, or can you elaborate more, and the and the patterns in weaving. I was, I was just going to say something I remember. Today, I wore this outfit. I mean, this, this kaftan. And this is from uh, Santiago Ilocosur. This was not woven yesterday. This fabric was bought in the 1980s. So Cora Agosto, she must be 90-something now. I don't know how old Cora is now. But with, at that time, she was very young, etc. And she, she's from Santiago Ilocosur. So people would ask me, Oh, how come you're wearing a tablecloth? Yeah, seriously. Yeah? Or, ay, may nakita kong ganyan sa kultura, placemat. Oh, di ba? Now, but the point is, 
Cora Agosto and the, the group of weavers in, in uh, Santiago Ilocosur are weaving for survival. They're weaving para meron silang hanap buhay. Di ba? So, they will keep weaving the same designs. But why? Because very few of them alive today can set the designs. You know, this setting a design is like doing a computer program. 0110011100, like that. And very few people can do that. So now, somebody as talented as Cora Agosto will set the design and weave it herself. That weaving is manual labor. Manual labor. Now, if your government, you have a respectable government, what you can do is you make Cora Agosto do nothing but set this on these designs, you know, and store them in bodegas. When she's gone, many others can weave that. And the design, design will not go because the design will not be lost, right? So because they are doing it for livelihood, vis-a-vis -vis doing it because of it's their passion, they like this, da, da, da. Then you can now see the difference between the new ones. This is considered new. You can imagine the ones today, even worse. The ones today, they just put a stick like a horse with like four legs like that and two slants like that. And then one nose and then one, one head of a horse, just four or five, um, uh, what do you call that, pinilian, you know, like that. And tapos na. And then the rest of it is just plain blue and white. That's all it is. But even this one still had to go there. It still has a diamond and a dot. This one, right? So I'm going to look now for something like this that's in the book. But that was done way before the computer was there. But that's still the same procedure of setting it. Right? So ready to weave. It's the design that, that, that we don't have anymore. The design masters that we don't have anymore. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. So now I would like also to show you the fabric, or I mean that the fabric that we have from the indigenous peoples in Mindanao. For example, uh, pwede ba show? Uh, so we have at my back, uh, pwede ba show? So at my back, we have here the tinalak from Lake Cebu. So we have the at, at the, uh, different patterns, the different designs. So one of the patterns, like what you would see there at our Galleria Independencia, it is named Gundong. So they believe that for the for the Tibuli, they have this. Um, they have three. Their, their traditional colors are three. So it's red for the bravery of the warriors. There's black or brown. It represents the earth or the soil, and the white is the fudalo it's the abaca spirit so when they weave it's not as, as senator nikki said it's not for commercial purposes they the abaca spirit or the deity of the abaca makes them dream about so the abaca spirit they are called dream weavers because they dream the the spirit the deity of the abaca would let them dream of what design to create so even in their weaving there is ritual, the deity are blessing them or giving them dreams of what to, what to. So as Senator yes, Nikki as would a, like to say something. I'd like to show you this pattern. Can you see it's all like tuloy-tuloy, di ba? One, two, three. Dikit, dikit yan lahat, di ba? These patterns that you can see. Look at how it looks in the book as an actual fabric. Yeah? This, this particular material. And if you look at it, um, you can see that's not tabi tabi dikit dikit, di ba? On this side, it's not tabi tabi dikit dikit. Yeah. But you will see, you will see that the if you count, if you count the threads, they're counting less threads than these to make these particular patterns. And the patterns now will have smaller patterns even then, like that. But this is harder to do because these patterns are only this big. So you can imagine that. It's all the same, right? It's like um, just like a series of it, you see? Like this. So you can now tell. Now, Agripina showed you the tinalak. Okay? I show you the tinalak that they used to make because, because 
Doing the tinalak, to me, is already torture. Torture talaga yan. I mean, I don't know if they're going to... Now they're selling 900 per yard. If you're a little better, you're 1,005 per yard. If you're a little even better, you're 2,500 per yard, you know, like this. And that's what the tinalak now costs per yard. Di ba? Hindi naman ginagawang per yard yan. So, just take a look at this. Um, wait. Hang on. You know, sometimes I have to... Because, <coughs> excuse me, the tinalak is something that we all know about. And um, it's actually like, a, it's, well, it's called dye resist, diba? So when, you're, when the fabric is now resisting the dye, here, you see? If you come to look at it, now, there are three colors, as Agrippina said. Brown or black, red, and the abaca. That the white that you see is the natural color of the abaca. Okay, so here's this woman who had already stripped that abaca fiber, had already um, uh, what do you call this? Um, set the fiber into her back strap loom. You know, it's that 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 wide because that's the the width of her body. You know, so that that she's strapped to that. Uh, to that loom. I mean, to, the, the loom is strapped to her body. Now, just for, just for effect, okay? Look at the difference between this, this, and that. Please show that one. Yes. Here. This, 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 okay, and that. You see how big these patterns are and all the same? Look at it here so that you can actually appreciate it more. Why? Easier to demonstrate. It's easier to demonstrate from that because it's easier than to demonstrate from this. I will explain it. If you have this, for example, and you want it, and you want it red, black, and white, you will have to you can just imagine this is a loom and there are threads. So these are 6 meters, 10 meters, whatever meters number of threads. The length depends on the size of her house, of the length of her, her, her place where she's weaving. The, it dep the length of this will depend on the size of her, the length of her house. Because in her house, in her house, she can sit here, for example, and there can be a window here just here the rest of this wall is closed it's it's, it's a, a sealed wall so if her house is this long oh it, she can go up to there right i suppose her house is only up to here so then her her fabric will only be up to here okay now so the first thing she has to do so these are threads 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 i don't have any thread but i have a wire <laughs> So you can no, see no, them. No, no, no. Oh, not there? Oh, I, I need a thread. Oh, here, here. There's a thread right here. Para you can see it. So here's a thread. Yan, ito. This is a thread, right? You see this? A yan, cable. Yan, yan. This is a thread, right? It's naturally not this wide. A thread is like here, right? So, so when you have a thread and hundreds and thousands of threads like that, this wide, this wide, depending, you see different widths, right? All the parts that you want to be white, you have to tie another abaca so that that portion that will stay white will not absorb any dye. So in your mind, you already have a design because there's no Xerox, right? There's no, uh, no, you just imagine, oh, I'm going to make this like this, da, 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 da. So anything that you want to remain as abaca color, natural color, Tatalian mo yan. So it will be all close. Sarado na siya. Hindi na maka-penetrate yung dye dun. Okay? Then, all the things that you want it to be red, whatever the part that you want to be red, this part, you'll also tie it. So you tie it also. So now you have tied the, the part that you want to remain natural color. 
and you would have tied the part that you want to remain red. What is left, not tied, is black. It's the, play, the one that will not be tied at all. Now, when you dip this whole thing into the dye, only the part that you want black will be black. Yun lang wala tali eh. Nakuha mo? For you to think of that, considering that this is the pattern, that's already hard, okay? This is easier, but look at it later in the book. So, when you do that, the red and the white parts have resisted the dye. So, it's the dye resist. It's called dye resist. The, 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 the abaca will now resist the dye because nakakover. Get it? Now, so you're done with the black, right? You're done with the black. May black na yon. Yung dye na dye na siya ng black. Yung part na gusto mo maging black. Diba? What do you do? Naturally, you remove the red. You remove the part that you want to be red. But don't remove the part that's white, ah. Dahil the abaca natural. You alisin mo muna yung part na gusto mo maging red. So lahat itong mga red, 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 red na to, remove na that, remove na da yung tinali mo. Alisin mo na lahat yan. So that, when you dye it again, that part that you want red will absorb the red dye. But the part that was black, even if the tela will get some red, it will not change the black because the black is a stronger color. Diba? So now, you already have red and black. Right? So what do you do? You remove all the tale of what you wanted to be abaka. So it will mean natural. So now you have three colors. Try and do that. So if I charge you 900 pesos or 1,000 pesos or 5,000 pesos per yard, ba't ka nagre-reklamo? Kung yan ginawa ko ng ganyang paraan, sa ganyang paraan, di ba? So, yeah. So, thank you. Thank now, you. now, you can just imagine if that were now like this. Ayan, red, black, and brown din no? Yan. And this... <laughs> These ones, they, these ones, you can tie a lot of, you can cover, cover, cover a lot, oh, a lot, a lot, a lot of the black, a lot of lapad, lapad yan, di ba? Now, what happens if this is the pattern that you want? You see? There, there's white, there's black, there's red. You cannot imagine, you have to tie the black and the, I mean, tie the part that you want to be uh, natural and tie the part that you want to be red. And some of it are only one line. It's like a running stitch. So how much tying do you have to do? Compared to that kind of tying that you have to do. Yeah? So that's what I mean. So now, if you see it, wait. If you see it here, because it's very hard to explain this first part, because it's also very boring to explain this first part. Now, if you have something like this, Finally, in the final analysis, you will remove this white part so it will become like this. Yeah? So, when they tell you now that if you want to buy this fabric, you want to buy this textile, it's one and a half million pesos, what do you say? Yeah? <laughs> Thank that's, you. <laughs> that's, what it's, that's what it's all about. Yeah? Now, in Indonesia, they're still doing it. They're still doing it. Some of it will look like that. Some of it. But I'll still, a lot of it will still look like what it was as I presented it to you. You see, the surfaces of this are very, very wide. These surfaces, red, black, white, you know, red, black, like that, natural, red, black, natural. They're still very wide surfaces. But in those days, 
when it wasn't a livelihood, it was a different story. Maybe they will have only two of that in their entire lives. It's not like every week, oy, kailangan matapos ka isang container. Hindi ganun yun. Kailangan magdala ka sa Bloomingdale's. Kailangan magdala ka sa Macy's. Kailangan, you know, hindi, hindi ganun yan. Hindi ganun yan. It will just not work. So that's now the difference between the tinalak of today and the tinalak when it used to be when it used to be our people doing that, our women doing that. So thank you very much for the demonstration to Senator Nikki. So you would see, for example, of course, this is uh, displayed at Sinugatan Gifts from Cebu, but we uh, put it here as a backdrop. So we, we also have there at our gallery, there is a, a, a design of Gundong. It's the name of the princess. It's a Tibuli princess. It's her last design. So that's why we made, we put it there, we displayed it at our gallery. And the one here, uh, uh, so there is also a design there below that uh, big tinalak. There is also a design, it's buluk halay, it's rice blossom. So there is a, they have names for their designs. Uh, yes. Every dot has a name. If you yes. read the text of the book, Every line, every dot, every cross, every two lines, every four lines, there's all a name for each and every one of those. Yes. Yeah, so, and also when we went to uh, the Higaunon and Talaandig, they also have their own, like uh, Senator Nikki was saying about the diamond. So there is really part of the Higaunon design, although I don't have it with me, even with the Tibuli, so they have the diamond, or in the Higaunon and Talaandig, diamond or the square. When I ask what is the meaning of it, it means many things. So, um, like, one meaning is that it's justice. A uh, square or diamond means justice. The community, even the Dato, it's usually the Dato who wears it, and uh, they always strive for justice for, for, for the community. And also, they also have the colors in the Higaunon and Talaandig. For example, in the and Talaandig, blue, red, and white. It's the same as the Tibuli. But uh, for, the, for the, actually, their meaning for the black in the Talaandig and Higaunon, it's, it's not the same as the soil or, or earth like the Tibuli. But it's about them being respectful to the dark spirits. So when they offer a ritual, like they offer food during rituals when they, especially, for example, when they ask the spirits, the deities to allow them to share with me their culture. We slaughtered chickens of, with red feather, white feather, and black feather because when you offer, you don't offer just to the white or the light spirits, but you give also to you also recognize the dark spirits. Like it's like it should be the black and white should there should be balance. So that's that. So that's the co color for the that the talaandig. And also for the higaonon, there is yellow. So there is a diamond with yellow color, and it represents the sun because they are children, the eye of the sun, or because they are children of the sun. So the sun is also very important. For them, so we have actually a higa onun dress there at the uh, Sinugatan Gifts from Cebu. It's their patterns of um, they have patterns like yes, diamond, and also you know they have the colors, the white and the black. So there's another thing that um about the diamond and the dot, and about these, um, when you see the diamond, in some in some cultures there is an extension, whether a straight line or a curved line. So it's like there's horns. This is the diamond, like that. Then there's like an extension or curve, you know, at the, at the end, okay? So if you see this woman, if you look at this woman, um, who, a weaver, you check her position out, you know? You just, uh, just imagine her weaving, and so this is her. Um, Remember, she's sitting on the floor. Oh dear, she's here in the front. Um, she's sitting on the floor, and um, it works. 
Yes, uh, it's this book. It's not that. Uh, this woman, she's a Yakan. She's a Yakan from Basilan. Her name is... Uh, she's the mother of Nana Kahadas, but uh, what's her name now? Papia. Her name is Papia. Anyway, so she's sitting on the floor and she's weaving. So you can imagine, she's like, she's giving birth to the textile. Get it? She's giving birth to the textile. She's she feet like that and then this comes straight out of her womb. You know, like that. So what is the conclusion that we have observed? Um, when you see these patterns, let's go breeze through it quickly. When you see these patterns, um, wait, because these are all with people. With, with no people, it, it will be see, shown better. Um, they're always, um, well, maybe later I can show it to you. But anyway, there's that diamond here. And there's a diamond and then a, like an extension of, of an extended part of that diamond, no? So what does it mean? We are we kind of like some out here. And nobody has challenged us. There's no real historian or, or anthropologist. And maybe you can maybe tell us it's not right or maybe whatever based on your research, right? So um, it's actually the reproductive system of the women. Take a look at it again. It's a diamond and a dot and like that. So like you have that fallopian tubes maybe. It's a birthing system. You're giving birth to that piece of textile. So that in effect from the vagina into the fallopian tube. They're quiet about it. They don't discuss it. They don't discuss it. Yes. They don't discuss it. It's not, it's very quiet. It's just among themselves, but it's all the women that, that do this. But the pattern itself shows and lends itself to that. So that is what, the, that is the kind of statement we wanted to make in the book. And so far, this book has gone through all the universities of the world, etc., etc., etc. Nobody has said, you know, that's really not true. So we leave it at that. We're not arguing about it. We're just, you were just uh, proposing it, I mean to say, bringing it forward, that this is really the reproductive system. So, <laughs> guys, salamat. It's as a very amazing information. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, thank you very much, uh, Sen Senator Nikki. So, actually, we also have our own local hand woven looms. I mean, fabric in Cebu. We have the hablon. Argao. So like this, they still create, the women still create this and they already have hand printed also Hablon Sargao. So, uh, and also they have created products uh, like um, tote bags and wallets out of the Hablon Sargao. So we would like to ask, uh, Senator, although you have already discussed it, but again, we would like to know why, why should we value our indigenous cultures? It's not just us. I think the cultures of the world value their cultures in the same way the Indonesians do. As a matter of fact, when, when, when this book is, is, is opened by an Indonesian, they feel a sense of affinity. They feel a sense of closeness because their patterns and our patterns are almost the same. Except, it, I mean, in Indonesia, they also have different places. You know, they have the different provinces that carry different... Um, maybe designs, but it's, you, you can still see that it is, it's unified. It's still one, right? So why do we have to value it? Because you have to know yourself, where you came from, to know what's good for you. If you don't know that, 
then national interest becomes a foreign word. So what happens? What is our national interest? Oh, sandali lang ay to ask Washington. You know? So, an example that I always make is Mexico. Mexico is just a wall away from the United States. So Mexico is a wall away from the United States. The Mexicans don't speak English. Right? We are 12,000 kilometers away. And we are the, I mean to say, the Filipinos are the, I mean the Philippines is the widest, you know, the, the widest numbers of, of big, biggest numbers of English-speaking people in the way that we speak it. The French don't speak English the way we do. You know, or the Germans, the Russians, the Chinese, they don't. So we are 12, 15,000 miles away, depending on which coast you're going to. Um, and yet, those that are 12 inches away from the United States have a culture that is distinctly their own. In fact, when they go to the U.S., you know, like uh, Daly City or maybe whatever in that area, southern San Francisco, the stores speak Spanish. I mean, the storekeepers, the, the, the sales girls and salesmen speak Spanish, you know. So they, it, it, it's, it is a sense of value that, that then of course, when that happens, and you know what your national interest is. It doesn't matter who makes the money. It doesn't matter who, what industry will be formed, etc., etc. No, my nation's interest is that American bases should not be here because they have a conflict with China and China has a conflict with them. So why are they going to put the bases here with all their arms, with all their whatever, destroyers, etc., 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 whatever, uh, war paraphernalia, war material here. Because if their enemy decides to hit them, they don't have to hit New York. They only have to hit your base that's here. So everything that you worked for, everything that you saved, everything you've inherited, everything you've acquired through marriage, everything that you really did whatever you could to keep it, is going to be gone. There's no rich, there's no poor in a war. Look at Gaza. They don't say, oh, these guys are, you know, they haven't eaten, it's okay. These guys eat, are used to eating, um, um, picking ducks, so let's spare them. I mean, there's no such thing. So everything that you've worked for, everything that you value, is not going to be worth anything. Right? So if that is your national interest, then why do you make decisions such that that national interest is compromised? And then start blaming, well, China's bullying us. Okay, China water cannot you. China has a claim. Vietnam has a claim. Malaysia has a claim. Philippines has a claim. Brunei has a claim. So, China water cannot you, then you water cannon them back. You both have claims. So, fight. Fight it out. But what is the enemy of China doing here? Diba? And I don't think they're trying to, they're trying to um, acquire us or grab us 100 million hungry people. They already have 500 million hungry people there. They want another 100 million people hungry there. They don't. They don't. They want us to be wealthier so we can buy more rubber shoes. <laughs> They want us to be wealthier, make more money, so you can buy more T-shirts. Or you can buy more Huawei phones. Or you can buy more um, Xiaomi. They, they're not going to get anything out of bombing us. They're not going to get anything out of putting us in a worse situation than we are in. You know? <laughs> well, it gives you access to these kind of things, right? Now, if you don't want to buy from them, it's okay. You can buy from where? Japan? You can buy from, well, from wherever, United States. You can buy from Europe. You have a choice. But they want to sell their things. So they, if they cannot sell their Geely, because everybody's laughing at the Geely, what did they do? They bought Volvo. Geely bought Volvo. 
you buy a Geely, you have Volvo technology. So, whose fault? I mean, they nobody can buy Volvo if Volvo isn't selling Volvo. Right? Nobody can buy your, your car if you're not selling it. So this is what I'm trying to say. Why? Why do we have to value ourselves? Because that will determine what you're willing to take and how far you're willing to go and how far are you going to fight. We're already kolelat. The, st the statistics show we are last, practically last, or last is Cambodia. We're second to Cambodia. So last in reading, last in science, last in math, you know, uh, the, the latest study shows that 15-year-old kids in the Philippines cannot count beyond 20. Yes. That's the last, last study. Tony Lopez, who is a journalist, has already concluded. And he calls it mass stupidity. Look at it in the internet. Read Tony Lopez, mass stupidity. Read his article. I, I'm not talking for him. He's not, I'm not his spokesperson. So this is now this so this is now the situation. Now, we're already kulelat. Indonesia has beaten us by leaps and bounds. Malaysia, uh, Thailand, you know, Vietnam. All the factories that should have been here because we're good English speakers are not here. If all the factories that went to Vietnam came here and all the factories that that left us and went to Malaysia or went <laughs> went to Singapore or went to Indonesia, stayed here, we're not going to be where we are today. Right? So, do you blame Thailand? Do you blame Vietnam? Do you blame Malaysia? Do you blame Indonesia? No, they have no problem with their culture. So, there must be some connection. It's not the only thing, many other things. But we're already kulelat, and yet we're looking for more holidays. <laughs> You know, if you're running a race and you're kolela, you want to run faster and longer. While the other guy's asleep, you want to run while he's sleeping. You want to work 24 hours a day to be able to at least be at par, you know, and produce the kind of work that you don't have to keep repeating ulit, ulit, repair, 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 ritoke, ayos, ay, whether it's construction, whether it's kaftans, it's always forever repairing, repairing, repairing. I send 20 textiles to the maker they send me 20 back and I return 15 back to them to the same people who are going to do the repair who are going to bring it back to me so they give me back 15 and I send back 10 then they give me back 10 I send back 8 then they give me back 6 I mean 8 and then I return back 6 and this is going on for forever and ever meanwhile I'm sending them another 20 so you can just imagine And the same guy or girls who are going to repair it were the same ones that did it in the first place. It's not going to go to another person. It's not going to go to his neighbor, her kumare, her compare. No, it's, it's, she's going to rip it all up again. And that's a lot of waste, wasted time. Yeah? But where is that work ethic? Where is that standard of excellence? I tell you to do something and you have to do it 42 times. I mean, what? Where are we? So you're already kulela. What kind of a mentality do you have that you're still looking for more holidays? When you're supposed to be looking for time or ways or education or training or whatever skills, rehab, whatever it is, to, to be able to, to counter that kind of kakulelatan, diba? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki, for... Uh, uh, giving us the relationship between indigenous cultures and the national interest, uh, how uh, the national interest should be foremost in in the minds of everyone, especially the leaders, and also, of course, um, it would reflect on how we value our indigenous yeah, and local if culture. Value, if you value the indigenous people's works, look at the work in this book. If we were producing this kind of work today, Instead of what we are producing today, you cannot imagine where in the world we're going to be. Because these things are costing a hell of a lot more because they're done somewhere else. Diba? Kung ganyan yung ginagawa natin, so you can say, eh, ganyan talaga tayo. Hindi. Noon hindi tayo ganyan. 
ano nangyari sa atin ngayon, ganyan ang trabaho natin. Di ba? Yes. Kasi if you know your culture, hey, my great, 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 great grandmother could do that. Ako parunong ng internet. Ako meron na akong AI. Bakit yung ginagawa ko? Ganito. Samantala yung great, 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 great grandmother ko, nakakagawa ng ganyan. Pero ako, hindi, pinagmamalaki ko lang. IT ako eh. O IT ka. Eh, bakit nagugutom ka? Di ba? Marunong siya mag-Facebook. Oh, marunong siya mag-TikTok. Ba't siya nagugutom? Yung great-great-great-great-grandmother niya, yung, yung ginawa, nasa museum. Oh, di ba? So there must be something. That means you either don't know about it, you don't recognize it, you don't care about it, and you don't want to be like her. Thank so what do you end up as a DH? Diba? Ayaw mo mag-weave eh. Kung nag -we weave ka at yung quality ng ginagawa mo, katulad ng great-great-great-grandmother mo, hindi DH ang tawag sa'yo. Hindi ka $300 a month. Di ba? $300 a yard. That's a difference. It's the economics of it all. O, di ba? Pag sinabihan ka, ba't ka ganyan? Ay ba, galit ka pa. O, di ba? Galit ka pa eh. Kasi IT ka eh. So now, they, they people would rather be uh, in the call center than trying to, to master these things because they don't know. Right? Now, I can be wrong. As I said, any of you can challenge me. And I'll say, oh yeah, maybe you're right. But this is just how I feel. Because people are people. We have all two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet. And the women in India, unbelievable what they can do today. I'm not talking of the time of, of uh, whatever, uh, Mumtaz, Mahal, you know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking of today. What can they do? Why are they like that? They're very high in IT. The Indians, they're CEOs of the biggest companies in the world. They're Indians. Oh, but, ha, huh, how come their weaves are like that? Diba? Pero IT sila eh. Eh tayo hindi, yung IT natin, ano eh. IT, ikaw lang ang marunong, pero... Palpak ka pa rin kasi pag linagay kita sa isang environment na yung kalaban mo dyan, yung mga Indian or yung mga Chinese o yung mga whatevers, nawala ka ng bigla. Diba? So this is the thing. <laughs> so uh, we have this last question for Senator Nikki before we get the reactions from our uh, reactor. So you would like to ask uh, Sen Senator Nikki, how can the Philippine textiles be promoted to the mainstream when there is very little appreciation for it, and and our textiles are also very expensive. Uh, how can this be? Okay, what is expensive? If everybody with a brand new uh, Christian Dior or Chanel or Hermes or uh, Louis Vuitton bag, brand new or second hand, okay lang, <laughs> could buy that, why are they not buying 2,000 pesos per yard, 3,000 pesos per yard text fabric made in the Philippines. Does it mean that they think, eh, yung taga Cebu, hindi naman kailang kumain, that taga, taga Argao, hindi naman kailang kumain yan eh. That means you're not worth it. Ang tingin niya, it's not worth it. It's worth buying a second-hand Louis Vuitton bag. A third-hand Hermes bag. But not to buy a something that's made by Ant Hill. Ant Hill. Yesterday, I went to Ant Hill. How much? 3,500 per yard. How much? How many yards do they have? Eight yards. That's all they have. Eight yards. How are you going to develop an industry for everybody in this room to even buy one, 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 table, one place mat of Ant Hill? There's, there's only 78 yards. Diba? Now, so... How are we going to promote this to the mainstream? Do we have to sell this at Thai Thai prices? Do we have to be a baklaran country so that mabibili? Bahay yung ukay-ukay na bebenta. Di ba? Kasi ang tingin mo sa sarili mo, okay na sa akin yung ukay-ukay. So if that's how you see yourself, nobody else has a future. Your designers have no future. Your seamstresses have no future. You know, the one doing the lilip has no future. Some people cannot even cut anymore. They can just make collar, collar, collar. They make 200 collars. That's all they make, making collar. Did they lose their job? 
They cannot even make a dress. Why? Because they can only make a collar. The other one can only make a pocket. I mean, wh what happened to you? So your dignity, you know, has already been compromised. Why? Gumagawa ka ng collar. Why don't you take another two hours every day to see how to make a sleeve? Yeah? So now you can make a collar and a sleeve. Okay? Or how can you, why don't you try and learn, you know, to, to embroider the collar, maybe? You know, to put some value added to it. Hindi. Basta ako, collar lang ako. Pasok ako ng alas ocho, gagawa ko ng collar, collar, collar the whole day. Uwi na ako. Bukas, ganun na naman. Five years na ako sa pabrika, collar lang alam ko gawin. May problema ka. Kasi even dogs can be learned, taught new tricks. You know? So there's something wrong. And what's that? Pagka may problema, wala kang pambayad ng uh, tuition fee, wala kang pambayad ng bigas, or yung, uh, yung nanay mo may sakit, ganyan. And then you blame everybody. Yung barangay namin, di may binigyan ng ayuda eh. Oh, di ba? But if you learned embroidery or learned beading during the pandemic, after the pandemic, you can now go to the how many designers and say, hey, I can do embroidery. Hindi ako marunong masyado, pero alam mo, hire me and in six months' time, I'm going to do things faster. I will know how to combine kinds of different beads, you know. Wala. Basta maghintay lang ako ng ayuda. Vietnam did not give any Vietnamese one grain of rice during the pandemic. And after they opened up, Cebu Pacific now flies to Danang. But Vietnam Airlines will not fly to Naga. So I don't know, maybe they come here. I don't know if Vietnam Airlines comes here. But what I'm saying is, during the pandemic, they build their roads, they build their hospitals, they build more schools. That's the best time to build. Nobody's making you pakialam. Wala kasi binigyan, kahit na pisong ayuda, wala. Diba? So there is something wrong. There's something that has to be discussed and talked about. Because the talent is there. The Filipinos are so talented. Well, we want to show it on a national level. We want to show it in a national scope. How is the 110 million, uh, 110 million talents going to push up your country so that you're not where you are? Diba? Kasi, transportation na lang. In Manila, I go, go through this every day. I have to go through an hour and a half of traffic every day, twice a day. And I go from Makati to Quezon City. But one hour and a half, I could reach Davao. You know? See what, I, what you see what I mean? What I'm saying is, I've been going at loggerheads with the Department of Transportation. And they insist, oh, you know what? We, we are already doing so well because there are another 300,000 cars in the streets. And you know, I said, you know, you do not measure, you do not measure the progress and development of a country by the number of poor people who have cars. You measure the progress and the development of a country by the number of billionaires who ride the train, ride the subway, and ride the bus. That's a progressive country. Hindi yung lahat ng tao sa Barrio Luz, bigyan mo ng kotse. Wala ka na, hindi ka na makalabas ng bahay mo. If everybody in places like Barrio Luz will be given a car each, you cannot even go out of your house. You're going to stuck there in the driveway, you know? Wala na. Forget it. Diba? So we have to re re rethink. And these are the people that have to be moved. They have to be moved from their house to their school, house to their workplace, house to their factory, house to their whatever, their pier, whatever it is. House to their everywhere. If they can't move, one day you're going to be a situation where all the bosses are in the office and there's no workers. They can't find a ride. And you cannot give them all cars. Diba? So we have to start rethinking so that everything else that we do is consistent with that thinking. I mean, we discuss so many things now, whether it's clothing, whether it's this, that, 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 transportation. You, the entire gamut. You want to go into healthcare? It's the same thing. Same thing. Education? The same thing. It's still... Ano ka? Anong tingin mo sa sarili mo? Di ba? So, in education, they say, oh, don't fail anybody. 
Huwag ka maglalagpak ng bata kasi no child left behind. You're building a 12-story building. Grade 1 pa lang, butas na to eh. Pero kailangan pumunta siya sa grade 2. So pumunta ngayon siya sa grade 2. Grade 2, butas dito. Tsaka butas yung grade 1 niya. Mahihirapan na siya magbasa kasi hindi marunong. So hindi siya pwede. Oh, grade 3 na siya. Grade 4, grade 5. You're building a 12-story building and each floor has already butas. Pagdating mo doon, you just put two tables on that 12-story building, the whole thing will collapse. Because holes na yung in-between eh. Puro holes, holes na yung in-between, you know? So this is what I'm saying. So you, you can carry that through any particular sector, anywhere, any, any branch of government, any anything. Ganun pa rin yun. It all boils down to, you don't know what's good for you. You don't know what's good for you. Malaysia, today, four ringgit to one dollar. Four ringgit to one dollar. We, when I was in grade seven, was four pesos to one dollar. Today, it's 56. Yeah? So you can imagine, a country that's four ringgit to one dollar today, and as far as I can remember back, and four pesos now becomes 56 to one. So your, your gasoline was one dollar, that is four pesos. Now it's already 56. Diba? So, and everything is imported from Sibuyas to Asukal to Bigas to whatever. To, you want a textile industry? You want a garment industry? Ha! Huh. Even your needles are imported. Even the pins are imported. Okay? Your tape measure is imported. Diba? Even the garter or whatever, the, the buttons, the, the, the whatever is imported. So, how are you going to develop an industry? You see? Because you don't know what's good for you. But if you are going to start now developing that, then maybe you can try and catch up with Indonesia. Indonesia, Bandung is the, the factory uh, where all the textiles are done in Indonesia from Jakarta. Maybe it takes four hours, five hours to get from Jakarta to, Indonesia, to Bandung. Well, they're fast. They asked China to build a railroad from Bandung to Jakarta. So it's now one hour. So your textiles are moved faster. They get to the ship faster. They get back to whatever you're importing, zippers, whatever, you, uh, whatever it is, they get back to you. Yeah? So you have a textile industry. So whether you want dots, stripes, ethnic design, kung ano man, meron silang ganon. Yeah? Anyway, thank matagal thank usapan yan. <laughs> Oh. But thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Agripi. Yeah, we have questions still and reactions. And I see, I see, so, um, I see Kingsley. Kingsley over there is in the very back. I see him. He was the one that actually introduced Agripina yes. to me. Thank you. Kingsley or Queensley, whatever. <laughs> so we, th okay. we, we thank uh, actually Kingsley for um, uh, introducing Senator Nikki to Famgrass and uh, asking us also to host this uh, conversations with Senator Nikki about the indigenous cultures, our weaving. And of course, this is very important and related to everything else in Philippine society. So we thank really the brilliance of Senator Nikki about in explaining these things. So there is a question, but we will have the reactions. So maybe Senator Nikki can answer this, the questions after the reactions from our uh, uh, reactors. So there is a question about how to support the Abaca weavers. And uh, I remember also, this is from Dodds Milan, a tour guide. I also remember a discussion last year in Lala or La or Pagla, weaving in the Visayas. And then we had as a, as a reactor at the time, the regional director of the Philippine Fiber uh, in Institute of uh, Philippine Fiber Development uh, in in. Fida, and he was saying about they have these uh, programs to support the fiber uh, farmers, those who plant, who grow fiber. But then there is another agency for research in developing the fiber. Uh, it is a national Philippine, Philippine Textile Research Institute. And there is another another agency that is in charge also for uh, helping the 
the the people or handicrafts people in selling this and this is DTI. Uh, so when I asked, do these agencies uh, collaborate and meet? And uh, no, they don't meet. And then he was mentioning that the local government should also have a part in in uh, in coordinating with these agencies. So anyway, that's the discuss that's the the discussion last year October in our discussion about weaving in 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 the Visaya. So um, maybe Senator Nikki can answer this question later after the reactions from our uh, reactors. So from the insights of, after the insights of our reactors. So first we will have. Um, we will have our, so while they are setting up the camera, we would like you to know that we have our uh, indigenous people's uh, handicrafts and uh, items at our Sinugatan gifts from Cebu. And this is the Tibuli belt from, and very expensive also. Pero okay, Rani, not, not like Louis Vuitton, not LV. So, so of course... Uh, no, but before it was all made out of brass. <laughs> uh, those were yes. all made out of uh, the, solid brass. Uh, yes. Because the, uh, I have about six of those, all yes. in pure brass, all yes. chained together. Ay, fantastic. Yes, and Catriona Gray, Miss Universe, wore pure brass uh, belt. So this is not as expensive, not as expensive because there are other uh, beads in this belt. So aside from, from the, of course, there are belts. The bells are amulets, and as I, and of course, it, it will ward off the evil in everywhere. So <laughs> we should have many bells, and even their, you know, their their uh, bracelets, the brass bracelets also have bells, and they also have anklets, so brass anklets, and they have, of course, bells, bells, <laughs> brass bells, so and uh, brass decors. Uh, like uh, small gongs, uh, so and of course beads, uh, beads, beads, uh, earrings, and beads anklets. So the higaunon also have uh, earrings there. So they are, of course, we see the patterns, the design of this. The higaunon. Uh, this is a headdress. So. You wear it like that, so you become like a princess. So, ang <laughs> But you see, there's also one thing that yes. we have to capitalize on. Eh? Yes. We're good in doing small things. We're yes. very, very good in doing small things. We're not very good in building big things, you know, in the same way that maybe China or other countries have, you know. Small things, magaling tayo. The best in Christmas decor. The best in doing. Magaling tayo, you know. So, galingan natin kung saan tayo magaling kasi may value added dyan. Don't go after the bargain basement market all the time. Gusto natin, benta natin 10 cents, 10 cents. Why don't you sell something that's $50? And then, you make less pieces. Hindi ka nakasubsub sa trabaho to make one container, kikitaan mo 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents. No! Like Mia, for example, Mia Protasio, she's a lighting designer. She used to do Christmas decor. Where does she sell? Galerie Lafayette. Why am I gonna go to the Costco? Bakit jan? Yung bantingi mo sa sarili mo again. Balikan mo sarili mo. Bakit? Ayaw ko gumawa para sa Costco. Gusto nyo? Magpagawa kayo sa pabrika. Hindi ako. Pero if me, I would rather sell to Blooming, not even Bloomingdale's. I'm Bergdorf. You know, I don't wanna go to Bloomingdale's bargain basement. Why? 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 Yung magaling gumawa ng tinalak, pinagagawa nyo ng stripes na wala na yung talent sa tinalak. Kasi ang kailangan sa ang kailangan sa Bloomingdale's basement ay basta meron ka lang masabi na made in Asia or something. So don't put me in that category. Why, why are you, why are you, the, why is my government telling me to just make stripes and make plain para makabenta ako ng one container? di ba? Hindi, gumawa ka lang ng konti. Pero yung konti na yon mataas ang halaga. Nagkang salamat, Senator Nikki. So now, we will have the reaction from um, an advocate on sustainable fashion. Uh, please uh, welcome. So he has a microphone. So uh, so may we show, uh, De we have Dexter Alazas.
Hello. Good afternoon, um, Senator Nikki. Uh, yes. And um, thank you for coming to Cebu and giving us an eye opener on Philippine textile. Um, I've been very um, passionate about doing this since the year 2000, um, since I joined Mega Young Designers Competition in Manila, and we represented Cebu. And at that time, I was um, really looking for a fabric that is really based in Cebu. And we've known of the industry called Hablon in Argao. But at that time, at a very young age, it was so difficult to get it because it's expensive. And talking to the weavers is really like a sort of from two hours away to travel. And with that kind of very expensive and hard to obtain fabrics, I ended up just using whatever is available locally. Um, but still using cotton, voile, um, cinnamai, and lots of very local fabrics because I wanted to represent Cebu at that time. But um, moving forward, there was campaigns on doing that, but I noticed in Cebu, there's, uh, there, we have an association here. And at that time when we had an organization called Clothes for Life, was um, one of the pioneer in organizing uh, designers. There was a talk before, and we had a meeting with all these senior designers that the Garment and Export Trade Board, or the GETB, was abolished that time. And the GETB was one of those proponents that supported export abroad. There was even fashion shows um, aimed towards creating local fabrics and bringing it abroad to, you know, to market it. And there was, um, I cannot just tell who um, the exact words, but um, I think the former secretary at that time, DTI secretary, said that the textile industry of the Philippines was on its sunset. Um, and then that's why they had to ab abolish it. And so um, that was probably a time that it died down, the industry. And then the influx of China coming into the Philippines came about and opened a lot of chai, um, textile stores in Cebu, sell, even all over the Philippines, selling things from abroad. So I think um, at that time when I thought of it, I said my hopes of having all these dreams of textile, local textile, crushed because um, you can't even do something about it because that's government. And so I was just wondering what happened to Nasida, what happened to GETB and all these textile development things going on. And even about the, the thing that um, San Miguel Corporation supported, which is the, um, uh, the um, how do you call that, the, the linen, the um, Rami linen um, die down. Because we remember it was supported by San Miguel Corporation. So with all these things that happened, um, there's the really government um, sort of intervention that happened and um, why, why we need to bring it back again. Actually, um, it's also a strange situation because during that time, there were crises all over the world. And um, the textile industry is one of the big employment um, industries. You know, you, you employed a lot of people. A factory could easily have 10,000 people working. However, it's not just that every industry depends on many other, um, you know, elements in the chain, right? So you don't grow cotton. You'll have to import that. Then they had weaving as in weaving fabrics, mills, and they have knitting mills that time. At that time, there was also a, a labor unrest, and there was also that situation where energy costs were very high, and textiles really, really are, is very dependent on energy. Then you had the fluctuation of the dollar because in 1972, we stopped using the gold standard, I mean, the, using gold as the standard. The, this Bretton Woods thing was all completely replaced by the IMF World Bank. So the game plan was to lend you money so that they can collect more. They lend you, 
US dollars. For every dollar, you're paying four pesos for that one dollar. A few years later, the exchange is going to be eight to one. You will have to produce twice more materials to be able to pay. You cannot. Your factories are running on very limited uh, capacity. Because that, these are old factories to begin with. Okay? Utex, Gtex, Gentex, Litex, huh? uh, ITM, in, in, Imperial Textile Mills. These were the, fa the, the, the textile companies of those days. Then it will now, so you can borrow now more monies to be able to pay them. So your $1, you now have to borrow $2, hoping that you can recover. Then the interest rates shot up to all the way 37% per year. 37% per year. That's the same interest rate that your credit cards charge you today. 3% a month. There's no way a factory can make that kind of money. Yeah. So many things were going against you because of government policy. And because after the war, the United States decided, hey, we're the big, big guys. So we, we dictate to everybody what should be done, how it should be done, etc., etc., etc. So that way, the factories closed down. And conveniently, imports started coming in. We had a policy before during the time of Garcia, Filipino first. So you have to buy Philippine-made products. Rami was introduced, and Rami did well for table linens. Then they said, okay, government employees have to all wear Rami. That was a rule. You have to buy uh, Rami uniforms. Rami fibers are very short. So it's itchy. It's itchy because it's short. Look at how long the abaca fibers are, you know. So no matter what you do, an abaca fiber will not be itchy because for that length, there's no, there's no putol putol like that, right? But you have to beat it. You have to really beat it. And in the indigenous, in time of the indigenous peoples, after everything is said and done, they'll get the big shell and, and rub it onto the abaca so it becomes shiny. Well, these things you cannot do by machine. You do by hand, right? So when you ask what happened, marketing our products. And, and remember, we're not existing in a vacuum. The Korean, fa after the war, Second World War, the Korean factories, the Japanese factories, were, were all in full speed, full steam ahead, you see. Then you had a situation where people's businesses were just taken over. Gentex was taken over. You know, then Utex decided to close. Well, well I, you, everything, is just, everything is just stacked against you. But more importantly to me, it was really the exchange rate. Because you cannot keep borrowing at 4 pesos and paying at 21, 22, 25, 28, 36. How are you going? You borrow apat na piso lang ang hiniram mo eh. That's excluding interest. That's only the exchange rate. Okay? So you can imagine that, that, kind, of, that kind of a hellish um, situation should be enough reason not to deal with them again. Huwag ka nang makipag-usap sa kanila. Ang hirap kausap niyan. So now, you borrowed money at 50. Now you have to pay 56. That's already... <laughs> at 55 pa lang. That's 10% already. You're not going to make that money. Right? So this is something that you have to think about. If you have a... a um, not only double-bladed, you have a triple-bladed weapon right then and there. Right? So, this is, this is reality. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. So, we have a reaction from our online audience saying, Thank you, Senator Cossetting, for the inspiration to assert our national identity. So, Shangri, from where are you? And are you from USC? <laughs> San, uh, Shangri La Huan. <laughs> Huan. So, uh, now we have the reaction, and our next reactor is a professor at the School of Fine Arts at the University of San Carlos. Please help me welcome P Professor P.V. Rodney Sinining. Good afternoon, um, beautiful senator. So the, <laughs> so the the only thing I could say or my reaction for today is that uh, the experience with you is really sublime. 
because um, me as a young designer or a teenager, I've been reading and um, seeing you in magazines and in the TV. And right now seeing you right here, it's, I'm really, really stoked. And <laughs> so um, right now um, I'm really grateful because um, me as a teacher, uh, I'm a teacher in fine arts, um, in Philippine costume and Philippine arts. But uh, my focus is more on the aesthetics, more of the visuals. But with you, with your um, profound wisdom, I mean, it's really, really um, very precious upon learning all those backstories on those process, on those weavings, all those designs, how the circles came about and everything and whatnot. Um, really thankful and it, ex it expanded the horizons of my plane of knowledge and I'm really, really confident in sharing with my students. So one thing I would like to, uh, uh, to say is that um, I agreed with you, Madam, um, in terms of the, I think we need, uh, it's more like an awakening. So it needs a lot of rethinking, okay? Rethinking and we need some change of plans or a st strategic plan. Because you see, we we um, we Filipinos as artisans, designers, or artists, we, we are uh, the talent there is given, the skills is given, but the problem there is how could we sustain or endure that idea or concept? So we lack uh, a push or an implementation. Yeah, it's still going on. I mean, it's like a vicious, vicious circle based on my observation. But anyways, uh, with that. Um, in, in the in the um, vicinity of a university, we're also working hard um, in incorporating and making this you know um, this cause or this advocate more workable because we incorporate in our curriculum what we call CES. We call it Community Extension Services, and at the, and lately we um, incorporate the SG. D, which we call the sustainable uh, SDG, which we call sustainable development goals. So, um, so um, as a uh, as a role as an educator, as a role of an educator, I think that the future for this and to make this uh, a reality, it's on the hands of the of uh, the hands and the minds of our new generation, most especially to our students. So I think that's all I could say and react to that, Madam. Yeah, I think it's important that you become, a, or that your generation be really becomes the conduit to the younger people. You still know perhaps what it was like to use a dial-up phone. You still probably know what it was like to turn the channel of a television set by a knob. And when the channels of the television stations were the same as the numbers on the knob. So if you're watching channel two, you turn the knob to channel two. When you're channel seven, you turn the knob to channel seven. Now you can turn the knob to 183. You know what I mean? I mean, press a button to get to 183. So, you know, you are still in that, you are still part of that generation that knows what that thing is like. So, because those who did not grow up using a dial up phone, think completely differently. That's, to me, the borderline. That's the borderline. Those who know what the dial-up phone is, hello, party line? Gagamitin ko yung telepono, ha? Sara mo yan, sara mo yan. Ngayon, wala kang pakialam. Hey, hey, I can talk to you for one hour, and I can delete you if I don't like you. I can, ito hindi, wala. And if somebody wants to call you and you're not there, sorry na lang siya. Maghintay siya hanggang bukas. But we were never late. We were never absent. Nobody will call five minutes. Hindi ako makarating ha, kasi traffic eh. Walang ganyan. Maghintay ka. Do you know, the, the, you, everybody. So that kind of a mentality, that kind of psychology, you cannot teach that. Those who did not grow up with a dial up phone, ask them, Naka -dial, nakatawag ka ba ang telepono na dinadial ganyan? Dug, 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 dug. Chik, 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 chik. O, di ba? Oy, party line, sara mo yung telepono ha. Gagamitin kanina ka pa dyan. You know, walang ganyan. Di Kasi ngayon, kanya-kanyang line ka eh. You can even talk to five people at the same time. You know? So you don't have that. Right? So that is why you and that generation 
is important as the conduit that's going to give that message across. Earlier, we were talking about there is no curve line in weaving. This is a two-dimensional thingy, right? You want a curve line, you got to work at it. You count the, the, count the threads. Okay. So I want to show you some of the specimens that I have here. This is from my collection. I mean, That's why it's called Cusicos. That's why it's called Cusicos because it circles. Oops, you're covering. Oh, oh there, see? There, it circles. But there are no curved lines. You only have an optical illusion of curved lines. These are all rectangles and squares that are four-sided with straight lines. You see here, also here. There's really still no curved lines here. You see? So these ones are still circles. They look like they're running around like that. Yeah? So these are mathematical computations that women weavers have to make. Yes. 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 So agree. why do you make these mathematicians into DH? Why? <laughs> Actually, madam, um, with those patterns, um, ancient patterns. Um, it's way before the computer age. Oh, it's more fractals, and they're they're quite genius, you know. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> and, what I mean. So there's something wrong <laughs> with the generation today that think they're smarter than everybody else. You know, I don't think Henry Ford had a computer when he did the Model T Ford, right? It wasn't a um, 3D printing car. <laughs> so. <laughs> And, and also, there's one thing I would like to confess, because um, 10 years ago, I, was, uh, I went to the library in the Filipino section, and of course, I need some resource or books. But actually, when I went there, our F Filipino section right there, it's, it's limited or forbidden. And I just asked the, it's a young person, then I asked for recommendation, what books to use for Filipino textile or other thing, or arts uh she gave me two books but you know what um they, they didn't recommend your book but uh i don't know if you're aware with pitoy Mirano. he made a filipino costume uh well i use that as a as a reference but maybe i'll try to ch by by this coming monday i'm going there in our Fil filipina section and try to ask if you have that hobby book by nikki because oh, we don't Sina have unang hobby. I ah, okay. Oh, sige. So I don't need to confess the I. Sorry. Nah, -ah. is it there? Is it there? We will we will order, or maybe not in Talamban campus. Maybe it's in main campus. Oh. Okay. Are there are there copies, madam? Uh, it's in a, a Sacred Heart school, in according Heart. to our. So we would like to introduce our next reactor. So our next reactor already said that he had read the book Sinaunang Habi when he was still in high school. So, <laughs> so, okay, so, Kingsley, that's your job. Kingsley, where are you? <laughs> he graduated okay, from Santa You better Paragos. make uh, the rounds of all the Cebu um, uh, libraries. <laughs> libraries and LGUs. But better still, you need to talk to the institutions. For example, um, maybe Gaisano, maybe uh, Gotong Lines, maybe you know, institutions ba, that, that, um, that would be of, of, of great help because, you know. That also can donate the book. <laughs> they, they buy the book. They yes, donate they donate it to, it to the, the school. So we would like to introduce to you our uh, third, last but not the least, reactor this afternoon. So we have a teacher of the Fashion Institute of the Philippines, Cebu. A fashion designer, please help me welcome Ray Umberto Villegas. Uh, good afternoon, madam. Uh, actually, hearing the talk, actually, the problem nowadays is the weaver. Actually, it's not, I mean, aside from the weaver, sa amin mga sastre, because the old generation didn't pass it. 
to the younger generation. I think the problem for me, like just listening, I think it's the passion. The younger generation lost that passion. Because as we could see in the weave that was compared, why is it different? Why was the old weave was beautiful compared to now? Because let's face the fact, the need of financial help, they want it fast. Compared to the olden times, it was more on passion, the love. It's like, it's like a hobby. Weaving was like a hobby. It was a ritual in the olden, in the more olden procedure before the party line was invented. <laughs> but now it's more on, they want it fast. Just like our lifestyle nowadays. As we, we can see, fashion is has already fast fashion. So everything want it fast. And then we need to, I think for me, this is just my opinion. I think we need uh, to, to share to the younger generation that this is beauty, this is art, this has a heart when you're creating something. So it's not just the material that you're buying, but it's the soul of the artist that is weaved, that is made into that art piece. So I think that's, I think for, for me, as a teacher, I'm also telling my students or letting them have a glimpse of the past. So when you have a glimpse of the past, you would realize how beautiful it was and how it was started. Because these are the pillars of what we are enjoying now. So I think, I hope, I hope, I cannot blame anybody. Maybe it's just the generation thing. But I hope that the people who has that power could, you know, educate. Just like you, madam, you're educating us. So I hope there are a lot of people like you would do that. That's all. And thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, you're right. No? The people now are doing things very fast. In doing things fast, they're, doing, they're making a mess. A lot of times they're making a mess. You know, I know people with master's degrees who cannot write a straight paragraph. Yeah. There's no, it doesn't mean that you have a master's degree. You can write properly. You can, you know, you can read. Pro it doesn't mean that. I know. I have a school. I have, I have people who have taken their master's degree and our school pays for the teachers' master's degrees. If our teacher takes a mas their, their master's, we pay for it. But it, 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 it shows that everything, everybody wants to go on really this fast-paced thing, number one. Number two, uh, I think it's not, we're not able to put the genie back into the lab. No, the genie's out of the lamp, right? So um, they are going to go back to doing things if they can see that there is some financial reward in it, that they can survive, they can live off it. Cannot. Cannot. Why? I'd go back. Because people will buy half a million peso handbags, but they will not buy a 30,000 peso yes. dress. Yes. Diba? So... That's a problem. I mean, how much will you spend, for example, for Belgian linen? You know, for your nice mantel na Belgian linen. So you spend $50,000, $2,000 for a nice one. Okay? But for this, they say, ay, naku, wala yan. 400 lang dapat yan. O, di ba? Pesos. 
So it's it's a it's a system, a value system. And everybody wants to go on holiday. Everybody wants to go on vacation. You cannot in in Negros. My friend is the mayor of Bago City. When I found out that he was mayor of Bago City, I looked up their silk production. So they do. They make silk in Bago City. But uh, it's going to take you what? A year to wait? For, yeah, okay. Because they, when they set that onto the loom, you cannot cut it halfway. You got to wait until he finishes the whole thing. You cannot small order this. So what do I do? I buy shawls. Because they only want to make shawls. Madali eh. After making a shawl, you can sell it na eh. Uh, two yards of a shawl, three yards of a shawl, right? So I buy shawls. The shawl is 3,000 pesos or something like that. But they're only this narrow. They're not even enough for a sleeve. They're narrow. So you need to have two or three. So 3,000 pesos times three, so 9,000. Tela pa lang yun. But it you originally was supposed to be a shawl. Now, how many people are going to buy three shawls to make a kaftan? you either crazy or either... I mean, it's really insane. You know, right? Right? Now, you're crazy enough to buy... To, to make three shawls into a kaftan. Now, how many people are crazier than you to buy three shawls made into a kaftan that is going to be now four times or five times the price because you, you have to cover your cost. And it cannot be that because half the half the cost goes to taxes and goes to the commission of the store. Who's going to sell it for you for 3%? Nobody. Right? So you need to pay 40%. How about your taxes, your overhead, etc., 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 down the road? But you cannot even order them at 45 with. In Mexico, you can buy queen-size woven textile because it's men who are doing it. You know, to throw that thing across, yeah. the strength that you need to throw it across and then throw it back and throw it across and then back and back and forth, back and forth for, for 20 meters. You know, my God. You see? But in other countries, men are the ones who are doing the weaving. That's why the women can do only this length. It's easy to do this and do that and back and back. And on top of that, you still have to 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 peel it, you know the pinilian, for example, you yeah. still have to raise it so that the the um, the thread can go across. Otherwise, you will not have a pattern. You're gonna have like a bed sheet. You want a pattern? You want this pattern? Yeah. You have to count after four strands. You have to raise it so that it goes underneath. So what is what is uh, white here is blue here. Underneath is blue. On top it's white. And what is white here is blue here. Yeah, because if you have a pattern, you have to lift it up so that the, uh, the thread going across will go like that. So if this is white and this is blue, if it's white here, then it's blue underneath so that you can have a pattern because if everything is blue, then you don't have a pattern. You have a pattern because there's something that's white. And how did you get that white? You didn't cover it on top. You allowed the white to be on top and the blue is underneath. It, it, it's not easy. It's, it's a mathematic. And if you make a mistake, instead of five strands, you make six strands or eight strands. This is going to look like a, this is going to look like a television set na ganun, ganun, ganun. Yung parang, not your set, folks. Please stand by. Remember that? Whenever the black and white TV will go like crazy. Yeah, ganyan, di ba? Then you hear an announcement says, not your set, folks. It's not your set. Please stand by. We're fixing the studio problem, you know? Yon. Kasi, kasi, kailangan disiplinado rin yung kukuha. That's why sometimes, it's, ay, merong mistake. Yeah, may mistake. Tao yan, inantok naman siya, di ba? Nagutom naman siya. So, may duling na siya, ganyan. So, mahirap na ano. But you cannot, very few will do it perfectly, you know? Yeah. Yes. So, thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. So, we are entertaining two questions from the audience because uh, it's nearly six o'clock. And then, so we have Questions still from online, but we will entertain first and stay tuned for the trivia quiz with exciting prizes. Only two questions, one for the on-site audience one and more? one for the, you would like to, yes. so there is a reaction. A little bit. Uh, a follow-up like reaction. So we, yeah. we have uh, Dexter again. 
Yeah. Um, Senator, once again, thank you very much for coming to Cebu. Um, we have been longing for someone who really is an advocate for sustainable fashion and textile of the Philippines. My actually only hope is that you continue doing this and that we will be able to enjoy more of what we can um, get from you per se. Um, we wanted, we there were talks that we should put this on the academe so that even from the younger generation, we teach them already on how to do this and maybe fine arts schools in Cebu, like San Carlos, could really put more emphasis on a subject matter on textile, um, not just fashion design, probably textile development or textile technology, something like that. And then we just, I just hope that you give us more in one season or in one year, you give us like a quarterly seminar. We would love that. <laughs> or we would love to start I a I knew it. I knew it. It was going to be, who's going to hang the bell on the cat's neck? <laughs> <laughs> or we would love to have, you know, start this movement. We in Cebu, me passionately, um, I'm planning to really even uh, put further my Hablon advocacy into what I call now a term called Hablon Nuevo. That's a collection I've been making since I started advocating in 2014 in Argao. So for me, the Hablon of today has a reference of the past, but it can move forward and further to more textile, um, you know, hablon nuevo, like a new weaves. So that's my campaign. And we're just looking for a champion like you to really help us propel our um, advocacies and our dreams. And we need more, <laughs> we actually need more inspiration. We need more push because me as a designer, I'm frustrated of that because I'm, there's only a few of us pushing for textile in, the, in Cebu. Of course, the designers, it's more very, it's about economics. They don't want to use the hablon because it's expensive. Our clients also don't want to use it because they find it local. Because the mindset of some Cebuanos and Filipinos are very imported. They want to buy more imported and more local. With my campaign as Love Local and the Cebu Wear campaign, that's part of my advocacy. And I'm thankful also for Philip Rodriguez if he's listening because he's been very supportive of us and me doing this. And we just are so lucky enough, and thanks to Kingsley, that he brought you here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Kingsley. Uh, be <laughs> yeah, Kingsley. So, uh, because um, this is something that we can now look forward to, not just dream about it, but wake up the next day and acknowledging that there is hope for a textile, a Philippine textile, with you. So uh, there it's is actually easy, a... But it's not easy, you know. This is not easy. I've been doing We'll this be here to back you I've up, madam. I've been doing this for 50 years. So there is a question yes. online, Senator Nikki. This is from Jan Acevedo Patindol. This is a student of um, Dr. Joy. So the oh. move... No, not. So an advocate of... Cebu Heritage Advocate, Jan Acevedo Patindol, is saying the movement now is to, to use uh, the indigenous textiles in the daily wear. How does one ensure that the final product is still respectful of the origins of the design? And I think this is similar to the question from Bra Brian Yukaran, also a Katipunero descendant and a heritage advocate. There is a thin line between recreation for modern fashion and cultural appropriation. How can this be prevented from happening in our indigenous textiles? Um. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that um, we cannot go back to the indigenous te textiles in the same quality that they had been woven before. Let's drop it. We're never going to get that to get to that level again. Those who are still doing it are either almost blind or dying. You know, in Indonesia, the weavers, the master weavers have an allowance every month. So if they, what do they need to live? They need to live with X amount of money that's given to them. So if they weave two hours a day, three hours a day, six hours a day, whatever they like, or twice a week, okay lang, they will eat. Their families will eat. That's one. Second, um, when you talk about problem with the weavers, we are in a situation where weavers cannot really count on their pro pro productivity to sustain themselves. 
many of them borrow money. This advancing bale, di ba? Yan, ayon. That why why do you think nobody's doing this? You know, because they will say, let's say they borrow fifty thousand from you, so you lend fifty thousand. They will deliver products. They will not deduct, and the products are worth one hundred thousand. They will not deduct the fifty thousand to pay you. They might deduct five and borrow another ten. So over the years, over time, this thing becomes bigger and bigger. And if you are going to absorb that money into the cost so that you can sell these products to recover the loans that were taken from you, that were borrowed from you, you will have to sell this at a very, very high price. You see? So there's also, there's also that dynamic that, that, that um, people tend to really just keep making bale. Now, when people make bale, they weave. Somebody goes to their to their house and sees the woven fabric. Five inches na lang matatapos na. Hindi naman nila bibigay sa yun eh. Bakit? If they give it to you, you're going to deduct from them what they borrowed. If they sell it to the guy who's in their house right now, they will get the full amount and just tell you, you wait again another three months. Now, if this keeps going on and going on and going on, I mean, I want to tell it like it is, no? It's not like, it's not like, hindi, uutang ng uutang ng uutang sila eh. We have, we have some people, some people doing things for me, for example, umabot na sa 1 million yung utang eh. Pero pag nag-deliver nag sila ng goods, hindi naman iaawas yung 100,000, 200,000, hindi. Maybe 20. And then, uutang pa ulit after a few weeks, di ba? So, Wala, ang gulo eh. Kasi ang, ang hirap, ang hirap. That's why, um, when you talk about support, there's many ways to support this. No? Because fashion designers today cannot just keep um, making or sewing or, or designing based on the indigenous products. Yun lang magkaroon ka ng plain, plain, plain lang, not even handwoven, plain cotton of different weights, plain cotton, of different shades. You go to Thailand, you want to buy Thai silk, what kind of red do you want? It's 50 kinds of red. And that 50 kinds of red can go with another 50 kinds of blue. Because if you make the mistake of this kind of red going with this kind of blue, it looks disgusting. Sometimes an orange can go with the pink. It's a certain kind of orange and a certain kind of pink and a certain kind of yellow that you can put in between somewhere. But if you don't have that exact kind of orange and exact kind of pink and exact kind of yellow, don't bother with it anymore. Don't combine it anymore. ano pangit talaga, diba? So even that alone, which means your dyeing process, it's not just the weaving. You can weave everything, but it's all, it's all uh, beige, the natural color. But if you want now colors, now how many yards are you going to dye? Are you going to dye 2,000 yards, 50,000 yards, or three, three yards. Diba? Now, if you're going to dye three yards and you can make one blouse, um, how much is that blouse going to cost? Diba? In other words, it's a whole industry that we don't have. But if you, if you want, I see in the bazaars, or there are many fairs, or there are many shows that, that, that carry indigenous, or not even indigenous, maybe embroidery. Maybe we can start from there. If Cebuano um, artisans or uh, maybe people who work with fabrics can even just start embroidering right. Yun lang embroidery na tama. Huwag na tayo mag-isip ng weaving the tela or stripping the fiber, whether piña or whatever, stripping the fiber, pounding the fiber. Eh, madami pa yan, eh, di ba? Do na lang tayo sa bibili ka na lang ng tela at embroiderin mo. Yun lang muna. Doon lang sa embroidery. This value added na yun sa tela eh. Di ba? Yun lang. Then, a little bit higher than embroidery. Beading. Di ba? And, or hand painting. But we have to disabuse our minds that the hand painting has to look like a gumamela. Why are you confining your idea of a flower to a gumamela or to a katleya hanggang doon ka lang papako. So, 300 people now will have the same gumamela. 
Exactly. Oh, di ba? Eh, ayaw ko na yung gumamela. Yung tatlong daan na kami mayroong ganyan, gumamela. Wala ka na ba ibang alam? Oh. Ay, de, lalagay kong bird of paradise. Then there are going to be 300 people using the bird of paradise. You know, but internet is now available to us. You press birds of paradise or heliconia or different kinds of bamboo. Right away, in two seconds, you can have, unless your internet is slow, you can already have uh, how many kinds of varieties of, you know, haluin mo, ganyan. Or it can even just be a whiff of a gumamela. Why must you have a gumamela talagang ginrowing na, tinadad na ng drawing yung gumamela. Kawawa naman yung gumamela. Kapal-kapal na ng tela, nagbukul-bukul na yung tela. Kasi sa kapal ng pintura, di ba? But why? You can be just a suggestion of a gumamela if that's what you want. Di ba? So there are many ways to skin a cat. If nobody wants to weave, okay, how many want to embroider? Beadwork. Beadwork is uh, only beads, only mixtures, you know, from flat ones to, to curved ones to small ones, medium ones, and parang ano na lang, parang a speck of sand na lang yung beads. Ang dami niyan. In India, the, I don't understand. How can these men with big hands be... Bead is only in one, just dag, 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 ganyan lang o ganyan lang sila ng ganyan, natatapos yung beadwork eh. Di ba? In other words, no gender, no whatever is, is involved. And I don't know, but maybe you can start by that. The embroidery does not have to be baduy. Why? Why must embroidery be baduy? Di ba? It can be elegant, it can be nice. And when we create designs and when we create garments, Para bang walang katapusan. Lagyan mo ng lace dito, rickrack dito, I don't know, bias tape dito, butonis dito, ribbon, ganyan. Parang endless, dami-dami ilalagay. You know, less is more. Di ba? So you don't need to put a whole flower show into that one dress. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. So now we would like to entertain the question from the audience so please uh, so we have do we have a question so we have dr joy hera please uh, go to the microphone uh adiha raka dikaw are diri kanila lagi gitu lang diri agto diri lag diri lag oh diha oh nice uh that book I've been looking, you know, uh, I got a copy, but a friend of mine when I was in Germany, he asked for it as a parting gift, no? And I, I, I thought that, you know, I can still get it in the Philippines. And I took me, you know, there's, it's out of print at the moment. So I have two questions. Now on the so mic. Uh, is the microphone yeah, on? Uh, yes. I'm just taller than the mic, I think. <laughs> uh, two questions. Now one is, um, or a suggestion is, I think the book is very nice. I know it's a book for a long time, but there's no copy elsewhere. The one of Yuchenko, they used to sell uh, at Yuchenko. They're out a book. There's one in the U.S., but it's $743 that it will take, take you a long time to buy. Yeah. Yes, a copy. So, um, well, yes, I, yeah. $743. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's excluding shipping. That's why I was telling my, you know, I'm tempted to ask this friend of mine to return the book and I'll give him another, you know. <laughs> yeah, because that, because I got that book uh, when it came out, because you did the second printing in, I think, around the 2000, no? But there was only a very limited number. And I, yes. Uh, Microphone. What I tried to do to get the book printed was not to choose the cheapest printer. Yes. We had and bids. We had, we had five or six different um, mm -hmm. um, offerers, you mm -hmm. know, people who offered us, no? And we chose the most expensive one, Kyodo Publishing. Mm -hmm. It's a Japanese yes, printing yes. company. It's based in We're Singapore. Good, uh, paper. That's why you have the book mm -hmm. that looks like this. Otherwise, it's not going to be like this. Yeah. Yeah. The, the printing was, and everything was done there. But it's very good. Um, I think I'll, I'll ask a friend. 
please return, return your book. Your book. <laughs> and make sure he did not it cut the picture. It some was... people cut off the pictures. That's why some books, be careful, there are some mm. selling three, four hundred dollars. Yes. But missing na yung ibang pictures. No, I think this this was um, someone who really was an, also an artisan, so, ah. um, and very much interested. So I thought, you know, I can, you know, sometimes you have this uh, mentality that anyway, I can get this book in, in the Philippines. And, and at that time when I got it, it was uh, in one of the book launching and uh, so, okay. Um, this, so I think given this and the interest, because I think we have, um, we need a lot of reference materials. There are very few. The NCCA has uh, done uh, some, but it's still not of the same documentation. Ethnographic literature is also very difficult. I mean, and now I'm tempted to even ask, may I have a look at your collection, you know, so we're <laughs> for museums. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, a suggestion is um, if the copyright belongs to well, to you or whoever, um, is it possible to have it um, like a local book company prints it for? Um, yeah, but it, I think it's going to change the color. If it's no? not I going think, to look like this, yeah, I will yes, not have it printed because anymore. it will not. Uh, otherwise, um, do a saw. I mean, you know, I wonder if uh, you'd explore a soft um, copy, soft, soft ba no soft. Um, Soft uh, copy that e books, yeah, like, like e, -books. e books and scanned because the well, AI does detect uh, something like this uh, to a certain degree. Now, I think the other question is I was, I was listening to, I'm so happy. Uh, two connected questions one is this is policy direction, and I wonder because this has to, um, I think the the like the designers here are very much interested to uh, really work. Um, and, and do something. But I think it's also the support of policy direction. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to ask, do you have a friend in Senate or in Congress who can really push this and then relate it to, um, we have um, um, K-12. In the last two years, it's still something that, you know, they, they don't know what to do. Maybe this is the time when uh, this uh, technologies can be taught. And the reason why I have this, it's because we were doing a cultural map of, um, in Mandawe of old schools, no? And there are student projects, you know, of things that are functional and it was so funny. So, and, and they have, um, for example, we, um, tat, tanang, you know, it's it's in the furniture that uh, you use, um, bamboo, it's called gat in, in Cebuano. Uh, and this is something that um, is, a, is an art that's really dying uh, in our technology. And in fact, uh, when I uh, went to, um, when we were doing, I, mean, I was doing a museum, they need, we need furniture, no? And we need to have that cover, um, to have that seat. What happened was I had to look for one person who can do that. So in this direction, I, you know, it's, is there a way that you can influence um, Senate or Congress or friends who, who really can do and push policy directions for this and maybe revive Nasida, which has produced a lot of uh, artisans in the 70s and the, in the 80s, no? Um, I you. think it's also a matter of timing, no? I mean, say in the 70s and the 80s, um, these artisans um, that did Nasida stuff eventually were replaced by people who were doing more value added. And um, design has really always been a problem with us. One, because we do not read. We're not a reading people. If you do not read, you can't even learn to bake a cake if you can't read a recipe, you know. You if you if you are not reading, walang nagbabasa. You know, if you go to Me if you go to Mexico, if you go to even Moscow, I was there, subway, while going down the escalator, they have a book in hand. While waiting for the bus, they have a book in hand. Nobody here reads. <laughs> so you see, so if you're not a reading people. It's very hard to be creative, you see. You have architects who do not know who's Miss Van der Rohe. You have architects who don't know who Frank Lloyd Wright is. So you have a problem. I have spoken to architects. I asked, you know Miss Van der Rohe? No. You know Sue Fujimoto? No. See? So they don't, they, they aren't, you know, uh, you know Tadao Ando? No. So you're an architect. Why don't you know them? Because the people just don't read. Or if they read, it's only enough to pass the exam. Diba? So these are some of the problems that we are facing. It's not just substantially. Um, why? Because 
the weavers are not weaving anymore. Okay, they're not weaving anymore. If you can get access to linen, for example, you have this book. You can get the prints from here. Wow, you can you can hand paint it. You can Xerox it. I mean, to say what you call that, you cannot Xerox it. You photo what the fo scan and put it transfer. Then transfer on the fabric, on the textile. You know, do you know this um, artist, uh, well, this designer, Aphrodite Hera? You know, she has all kinds of designs, mixing this and mixing that, and they come out nice. Yeah. She's not hand painting the textile. She's not, um, uh, you know, but, but you can make it look good. And then people maybe will adapt to it because hindi matigas, hindi makate. You know, you, you, how are you going to wear tinalak? You can use the tinalak to make it into a bag. But if you're going to if you're going to use the tinalak as a as a um, fabric for for your shirt, or, it's makati eh, matigas yani, eh. ah, bakay yani, eh. di ba? At the most you can maybe wear it the saya of a borrowed saya because you can make it you know ganyan yah. But but you you cannot you cannot use it as an everyday garment. You see. So in other words, you have to be also um, with the times that these days. Uh, maybe a bit of embroidery, and, and but the patterns are already from here, diba? Yeah. Yon. Like I see Uniqlo. Look at Uniqlo, for example. True. You see all the artwork of the Japanese artists. You see the images of the anime from 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 Japan. You know, but they're on a T-shirt. But people are buying it. So you have to you have to make it. I uh, know you have to make it. Um, Something that people are willing to buy and willing to pay. Diba? Yeah. It's actually a mindset, madam. Yeah. Easy po lang. Kasi, why yeah. are you buying, you know? It Munakata. Starts... For example, you're buying Munakata prints. Yeah. On a, on a shoulder bag or a, on a backpack. What, why? Why are you, why are you buying Munakata prints from a, from a backpack? The original of the Munakata prints will be a couple of million dollars, but, you know, it's it's on your backpack, and you it's okay with you, right? You can even have uh, Andy Warhol's uh, Campbell soup in your backpack. So, what's the, what's the, why is it so offensive to have tinalak prints on your backpack? Because mababating in mo eh. It's the same like jargon or language. If you're talking to somebody whom you consider not even what he is, but you consider as higher than you. Then you get to speak to them in English. If you look at somebody and you talk to somebody whom you think you think is lower than you, and you speak to him in Cebuano or speak to him in Tagalog, but so why is this going on? This is going on a second nature. Even even Christian Lubaton, Madam, got patterns from Philippine textiles and created his own bag. Nabalita, na, nabaliktad po tayo. Yeah. Ang si Christian Lubuton na lang ang kumuha ng Lubuton, kumuha ng patterns natin, created bags from it, and earned a lot from it. When we Filipinos didn't even bother to use it in our own designs. So the problem also, madam, is the fashion designers of the Philippines. Ang problema nila, madam, is hindi nila ini-introduce ang local design to their clients. Gusto lang nila pao de swa, yung mga, mga stretch fabrics, but they never educate their own individual clients to wear local indigenous fabrics. So they didn't, it's supposedly a niche market, but designers are responsible enough to educate their own clients to have at least a piece of local in your wardrobe. When designers are just up to the, to the, you know, the demands of the clients, sunod ka lang ng sunod kasi magkakapera ka, na wala mangyayari. But if you insist on a certain line of clothing um, to really tell them to love local at the same time, although you can wear a bridal gown with silk, whatever, but at least a piece of your clothing or your wardrobe has a local. Like, you don't necessarily need to wear a suit. Just have a little barong in your closet and that's fine. You don't necessarily need to wear a terno but a piece of butterfly sleeve from a, a, a certain dress is fine. But to have a piece of local material, a fabric, an accessory made by local artisans is good enough to promote local fashion. 
Thank you very much uh, to Dexter. So we have one more question from the audience. Uh, one more reaction. Yes, please. Please go to the microphone and introduce yourself. Hello, Madam. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Albert Chan Paran. Uh, I understand about this uh, Philippine textiles when Katrina went to the Miss Universe and introduced all of her wardrobe to wear the Philippine made textiles. So as a Miss Universe fan, I was able to follow it. But as a Gen X madam living in Mindanao before, when you say it's local made, it's cheap. It's like, uh, why should we wear made in the Philippines when you can wear something like from abroad? So we have this um, colonial mentality that could be one of the problem. But growing older at the age of 50, I would love to, to bring with me Sana when I go to New York, like something bag or it could be something tinalak. But I could find it in, in the mall, but it's quite expensive. It's more expensive than having my plate ticket. So, so that's also my problem now. Even though I would love to wear your eighteen thousand to twenty thousand uh, caftan, but I can only afford three hundred pesos. So that's my problem, madam. I would love to have your pieces. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, thank you. Yeah. You know, yes. Well, uh -oh. Expensive. expensive. Yes. yes. I cannot afford it. It's expensive. Your mindset veered away. From our team, yes. we promote what is ours. So think of that as expensive. How proud of it. Yeah. We're bringing it to New York. Yeah. And don't make it cheap because we're Filipinos. Filipinos, we're yeah. <laughs> but actually, by by when I um, got into this Kaftan's business, um, I used uh, the fabrics that I originally I used were not from here. Yeah. Why? So that we can see that there are people elsewhere in the world with two eyes, two ears, two hands, two feet. They have kids, they have husbands, or whatever. They live in houses. They don't live on trees. But this is the kind of work that they can do. So that in the show that you, you, you attended last um, Thursday, you can see these are made by the women of Calcutta. These are women made by the women of um, Colombo, Sri Lanka. These are made by the women of Yogyakarta or Sheribon or wherever they are in Indonesia. And these are made by the women in Basilan. These are made by the women in um, Ilocos Sur, right? Look at the difference. I'd, I'd like to use our fabrics. Why not? But see... This one I like, this one's my favorite, and it's been washed a hundred times, so it's kind of like, you know, the, the color of the fabric is now different from the color of the lace, because before it used to be the same, but, you know, the lace color stayed, because it's, it's, in, it's, it's just kind of like lace, lace, you know, and this one kind of like faded away now, you know, the, the, the coloring. So what I'm saying is, I wanted to bring it in so that you can see why it is 40,000, 20,000, 80,000, or whatever. Because if you buy an Emilio Pucci kaftan, it might cost you $4,000. And $4,000 is 240,000 pesos because it's Emilio Pucci. See what I mean? But that's a kaftan, just the same. Right? Now, what I'm trying to say is, can we, as designers, as advocates, etc., crusaders, whatever, start with just embroidering? You saw those kaftans embroidered by the women of Calcutta in India. What are they? Running stitches. All just running stitches. But they created an entire pattern on the on the on the kaftan that you'd think it's printed. Or it's woven. Or it's woven. No, it's just raw silk. Raw silk. And the, if you want stripes, I can put. Three rows of red, three rows of aqua, three rows of orange, stripe. But when you look at it, parang there's three color stripes, di ba? Embroidered running stitch lang. Running stitch. I mean, that doesn't take, that doesn't take, uh, you know, a um, information technology wizard. Running stitch. Diba?
So uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator Nikki. So we have now the trivia quest with exciting prizes. So first, we have this question that the prize is because it's uh, the Trust the Abril anniversary earlier this month. So the prize for the for the answer is a tropical fighter. is a cocktail with help. Uh, healthy ingredients but with also alcohol so the tropical fighter nilayon tilat is the price for this uh and then the the uh, the one who would like to answer would raise his or her hand and go to the microphone to give the answer so this is this has uh fresh orange fresh pineapple fresh carrot but with tequila also and did you know that the According to some historians or some of our heritage advocates, that the Mexicans learned the tequila technology through our tuba from the galleon trade. So, so, so we have this question. Uh, please raise your hand. What is the name of the fabric or the indigenous textile or fabric woven by the dream weavers of Lake Cebu? By the Tibuli, what is the fabric? The name of the fabric, the blue, I mean the red, white, and Tili. <laughs> so it's for the audience. For and it's for the it's for the audience. <laughs> no, but someone would someone here would uh, or I will change the question. So what is the name of this fabric? That is woven by the the Tausog women of Sulu. I changed the answer because I mean I changed the question. <laughs> so, so what is the name of this or this fabric woven by the women of the Tausog women of Sulu? So give me this was also worn by Katrina Gray in the in one of her um uh, Attires in the are the reactors included? Oh, me, yes, we can have the reactors. Okay, please go to the microphone. Make sure you don't get the, the answer wrong because your students are watching. <laughs> so, who would want to answer? What is the name of the fabric woven by the Tausog women of Solo? Uh, either this one, actually, there is a rectangular cloth, and also there is a Square, a square, or oh, either the square or the rectangular. So we have the student from the University of San Carlos make your teacher proud. <laughs> so introduce your name and your complete name. May we get the complete name? Yes, what's your uh, name? My name is Pio Miguel C. Magtahas. I am a third year anthropology student. Yes. Um, my answer would be Pisiabit. Pisiabit. Congratulations. <laughs> The fisher bit is the hand woven fabric which is rectangular. I mean no, it's square. The candit is rectangular. The candit, this one is candit. I joined the, sh the scarves because it's short. So uh bit is the rect rec I mean the square, uh, square uh, fabric. And, and they have geometric patterns. So this also have meanings for them. So we have the next question. It's all, uh, everyone can answer through the comment section of the Facebook Live event. So make sure you have internet. Did you ask for internet for Wi-Fi already? Uh, so on online and on-site audience can answer. But the one who already answered can is, no, is now disqualified from this. So you can no longer answer. So we have the prize for this is from our Alima Native Massage. Um, our Alima Native Massage uh, also gives tribute or Visayan healing heritage to get an oration. In your kawa bath, when we show the kawa bath, so you will get an Instagramable. No, not not Lorenzo, only the kawa <laughs> with a, either a flower or a milk bath or a, a tinua. We have tinola, tinua bath with ginger, sea salt, and and lemongrass, and also um, or you can have dinagat or sea salt uh, or a leaf. Uh, so the the question for this is very easy. It's, it's, it's very easy. Give the complete title of the book published by Senator Nikki Coseteng and authored by Marian Pastor Rosses. It's on the comment section. <laughs> Follow instructions. We said it's you. 
You answer through the comment section. You answer through the comment section. The first one to comment the correct uh, title, the complete title. Yes, I una. I'm sorry, is he Francis? Karag, uh, qualified pa? Karag, is he already a uh, Hall of Famer in answering questions? Okay, ra? Si Dugay, naka one year ago, naka nakadaog. <laughs> so, uh, we have uh, the first one to answer. So, that from Tintin, it's only hobby, so it's not complete. So, Francis says, si naunang hobby. Congratulations. Francis Dwayne Branzuela, also from our Bagong Chatro Honkera and USC Fine Arts, and also from the Fashion Institute of the Philippines, Cebu. So, naanitanan siya. So, we have also, uh, Tintin gave also the correct answer. And uh, Ferdinand, uh, love, love says, si naunang hobby. Most complete kay with the Philippine ancestral weave. And uh, sina unang habi from Virgin Ascaraga. So, dagan salamat. Uh, so, for those who ha we have not, uh, for those who have we haven't, um, whom we haven't read your question. So next time na lang sad. Join us again next time. Kay uh, si Senator Nikki had a lot to say this afternoon, so we couldn't accommodate your other uh, questions and comments. So. Please join us uh, this uh, April 27 for a, uh, a dis uh, discussion with um, Dr. Earl Jude Cleope, Vice President of Siliman University, who will be here on site to discuss with us how Visayans were the terror of the seas, so how did in, in, in Asia or Southeast Asia in ancient times, since 1100s or earlier, and of course, um, we will be this. Uh, it will be part of the celebration of the 503, 503 years of the victory at Mactan. How the how Visayans fought. So it's actually sea warfare in ancient Visayas. So we have also we thank our partners, um, the the uh, USC Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and History, Trust the Abril Foundation Incorporated, and also uh, also that the. the Central Visayas Association of Museums, the Underted Center, and we would like to get the closing words, uh, the last, uh, the closing statement of Senator Nikki Kosateng for this event as we close the event. Thank you very much, Aglubina, for um, inviting me, and thank you very much to all of you who spent precious time to come and listen, come and engage, and come and just um, stop, look, and listen. You know, because um, this is not easy. You are more um, into it. You are more at the forefront because you deal with clients. You deal with a market out there. Then you deal with all the suppliers. And so you know the realities of this. I don't know what you call it. I think it's a plague already. That it's, I, I consider it a plague because it's kind of like a disease. And um, we will have to be pretty good doctors to navigate this properly. We don't want to insult anybody. We don't want to pretend that we're better than others. We don't want to make people think that we're, oh, oh, they're just hoity-toity and up and mighty, you know, like that. No, it's not. It's a very fundamental, basic desire for everyone to know what his or her roots are. It's a very, um, what do you call this? It's a very deep-rooted uh, desire for example, for us to know that we are not ships without a rudder. You want to know that you're a ship and you have a direction, not just go with the wind and go with the storm and wherever it goes, where you hit a rock, then too bad, you know? I mean, it, it's not like that. We have to chart that course of our destiny ourselves, and nobody's going to do it for us. So while we can, we're still on Earth, that's the only place I think we can do anything about it. Anywhere else we go, if we're not on Earth, I don't think there's much we can do, right? So um, I congratulate all of you because you still you have the fervor, you have the desire, you have that um, um, crusader in you, and um, that's a good start. You have to start thinking out of the box. We cannot straight jacket ourselves and expect to fly. You gotta let your wings go off, and and you know, and at the same time, bring everybody with you. 
you can't walk too fast. You can't run too fast. By the time you get to the finish line, you look back and there's nobody behind you. So you'll have to also learn to walk a little slower so that when you get there, then everybody gets there at the same time, right? So it's really a balancing act. We're like what? Trapeze, trapeze actors in a circus. And it's a tightrope that you have to walk. You're going to step on many people's feet or toes, you know? Government is something that maybe you cannot anymore count on, seriously. Wanting, the, wanting it, wishing it, praying for it, that's one thing. But really, the track record shows that you cannot count on government. Because if you could, we wouldn't be where we are. We have annual shows. It takes a lot of time to prepare, to produce, you know, to, to, um, to market. It takes a lot of time. But it only benefits a few. The few that benefit from all the trade shows, from all the, the, the fabric bazaars, all these um, you know, uh, exclusive um, um, outlets maybe that are in the malls, that, are in, 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 that, that cater to the supposed the higher end of the market. Yes, that they can make a difference. But the massive, the massive infusion of energy into the majority cannot start from there. It doesn't work on a trickle-down effect. You'll have to push or lift from the bottom up. Right? Because people who have the resource, people who have the means, are the first ones that will make tawad. Diba? Ibig sabihin, kaya naman nila bumili ng ganyan. Kaya nila, kaya nila bumili ng Mercedes. Pero kung sisingilin mo ng 5,000, tatawaran pa nila. Eh, ang hirap nun eh, kasi walang logic yan eh. So it's in the ugali. It's in the attitude. And that's very difficult to transform. You know? So, if we can produce a better product by not insisting anymore on going back to what they used, we see in this book what we, are cap what we were capable of doing. We see in the marketplace what we are now capable of doing. Those are light years away from each other. The quality, the, the sensitivity, the sensibility, the finesse, the refinement, the elegance, the whatever you want to call it, na wala na eh. Ngayon, it's really hand to mouth. It's hanap buhay. Di ba? So if we're going to take another dimension and look at it from another point of view and say, all right, we cannot go back so that the Subanans are going to uh, weave like the subarans of before. It's okay, no problem. We're going to take a fabric of today in linen, in cotton, in silk, or whatever blend, and we're going to take the subanan design and put it on the map. As I said, it can be even embroidering. Those Indian women, they embroidered only straight lines. Straight lines lang talaga. You saw them. I don't know if you saw them in the, in the, in the show we had last Thursday. Straight lines lang talaga. And yet, oh wow, they look like, you know, they're a thousand dollars worth. Di ba? So it's up to us. Many, there are many ways to skin a cat. And we don't have to be skinned, you know, <laughs> ourselves. Because there's a way to go forward. What we've not done, we can't undo. But what we are not going to do, that's the tragedy of it all. If we're not going to go about to embark on that, um, course or that um, direction because we're busy looking backwards. Right? So I congratulate all of you for your fervor, as I said. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure something will come out of this, Agrippina. Otherwise, don't talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> if, nothing comes out, if nothing comes out of this. <laughs> Dahil salamat to the very amazing afternoon at gabi na karon. Dagang salamat to the sharing the pa dagang salamat to Senator Nikki Costa thank for sharing with us her passion for um, our cultural heritage and also for national development. Dagang salamat to our reactors Dexter Alasas, Professor PV Senining and Ray Umberto Villegas. Congratulations to everyone who gave their insights and also thank you very much to everyone who joined who gave engage with us this afternoon online and on site. Dahil salamat og maayong gabi natong tanan.